So Barron's and Wall Street Journal basically have similar staffs that write for them, but Barron's is much more about you know long articles about companies, and and they they actually give stock tips. They write articles that you know are really about tips for the week. So if you get a good article in Barron's on a Sunday and you're shrewd enough on a Monday and you're doing this full time, you can make money by buying you know on the Barron's tip in some ways. I mean, not all the time. It doesn't always work. And the tables in Barron's also have some things that the Wall Street Journal doesn't have, which is um, tables of speculators, um, uh, commitments, this kind of stuff, which are little technical things that give you an indication of whether a market is going to go up or down. It's one of many technical, which, which we'll get to, technical indicators. So, yeah. So, but those are the three major the three major presses on the weekend, Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times out of London, which has the best writing, right. Gillian uh, Tesh, yes. very, very good, and Martin Wolf are two of the best financial right. reporters out there. Nomi Prince Prin sometimes works, you know, writes for Financial Times. So Wall Street Journal would not publish anything of hers, you know, unless... No, yeah. she's, she's outside yeah. the pale. She's outside the pale right now. And... Um, um, so, and then Barron's, like I said, is a, is a weekly that comes out, you know, that has many tables, but also articles, you know, round, round tables as well, too, of people talking. So they're, talking both, they're both owned by News Corp? News Corporation, yeah. Yeah, yeah News Corporation took out the yeah. Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Village Voice and then the Wall Street Journal in the last 25 years, you know, Murdoch's uh, group, the News Corporation. So, um, and Barron's. Yeah. And Barron's was part of the Dow Jones publications of which News Corporation bought out. Yeah, yeah. This was all part of what was called the Dow Jones uh, industry, you know, the Dow Jones um, press, right? And Dow Jones was the name of a, a literal person of which the indexes are, are built. Um, you know, this was a way of measuring, you know, the mostly highly capitalized stocks. Charles Dow was his name. And he created an index which included U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel, you know, back in the old days, Alcoa, Aluminum, um, General Motors, Ford, you know, all the big industrial, IBM, etc. Well before the Fang, you know, General Electric, well below, before the Fang economy began, which is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, which is now called Alphabet. But, I, you know, I'll, I'll do some things with these acronyms and all of that. But, you know, in general, you know, the weekend for most of these hedge fund people are reading these presses, di digesting, because they want to get the spin, you know, on the weekend of what, you know, people are thinking about, what they're writing, you know. And, and you know, it's my, my interpretation that they're sending codes at some levels to certain people. You know, whether or not a position should be maintained or a position should be eliminated. You know, but it's, it's not as fixed as that, but that's one aspect of it. And so you have a group of people such as, and I mean, I know this for a fact, uh, you know, um, um, I mean, I had the, I had the, uh, I was lucky in terms of my own um, adolescence to become friends with, a, a, I think I told uh, Beth uh, about this, a friend of mine uh, had polio you know, before the vaccine. And uh, he was older, about four or five years older, but we became friends. And uh, after he had had the polio, I did not know him before. Um, and all he could do was use his feet. He was completely paralyzed except in the mind and in his feet. He had use of his toes. So he trained himself how to use a computer. And he was, you know, this is what he did for a living was trade the stock market and was an advisor, financial advisor and stuff. So he knew, and he was very well known in a kind of hidden way, you know? So people would go to see him at his residence in Covington, Louisiana, and, you know, uh, get advice. And Soros actually went to see him once, you know, too, you know? So he had, he had these kind of connections. So, I mean, through him, you know, I learned a lot. We had a good rapport, you know, and, uh, you know, we had very different politics, but that didn't really get in the way. I mean, you know, the remarkable character who lived to be 63 years old, who went into an iron lung every night. <laughs> you know, you talk about the courage to really exist and, and to have, you know, pretty much a productive life, you know. He was actually the model for the uh, character in um, Walker Percy's uh, uh, National Book Award winning uh, novel, the, uh, the Movie Goer, 1962. He's really the model for Bing Smalling as a, you know, as a stockbroker, but fleshed out as a, you know, quote, normally living person, you know, <laughs> you know. 
And uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So it was interesting to me. But going back to this, so on in you know Southampton and in you know Northampton, you know in these places on the weekend, people such as Byron Ween, who used to be at Morgan Stanley, still good people, Soros, etc. You have these people that get together and discuss. I mean, it's like a, a junior Davos every weekend where you know these activities and what's going on are always happening. So there is a conspiratorial aspect here. Yeah. No question about it. Whether or not, that, but as you know, as a, a psychoanalyst once told me when I was very conspiracy, Mr. Velius is only 50% of the battle, right? The other 50%, what are you going to do about it, or where's the other part of the dialectic? So, so anyway, um, um, so yeah, I mean, anyway, so a kind of fascinating thing. So, you know, um, so I kind of grew, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, I, I learned this stuff very early. I had an uncle I would take out the Wall Street Journal off his desk and read it. And I, you know, I made some money and then the 60s happened. I said, what is this bullshit? You know, anyway, and I used to bail people out of jail because I had some extra cash, you know, all the all the radicals that needed in SDS and in Tulane and other places, you know, so. And then kind of, you know, gave it up for a while, but always studied and stayed, you know, kind of connected, and, you know, and at times, uh, you know. So I was always, you know, very interested in the political economy or the economic reasoning of the system and how it's working, et cetera, right? And I think that, you know, what's been really under-theorized and, and really not theorized, I've never really read anything that's, you know, uh, adequate, is really on the stock exchanges, how this works. You know, it seems to me that in a basic sense, there are four places where you can put money. You know, there's equities, <laughs> right? There's real estate. <laughs> there's basically bonds, right? And there's commodities. This is where the four central areas where money goes, you know. But, but our question is going to be more about what is money, <laughs> you know, what is its philosophy, you know, we're going to try to do somewhat of an ontology, but also do so through a critical analytical approach through the, those that studied it versus those that are developing theories around it. You know, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking of this as a, as a, as a, as a two-part movement, a kind of parallelism where the Marxist critique is operative, right? You know, through fictitious capital, the component parts of banking, what Marx in the third volume of Capital, which is hardly ever read, you know, because this is where we are. We're not in the first volume anymore. I mean, you know, commodification, and these things are givens. You know, when these people at Harvard, you're talking about commodification of desire. You know, this is 19th century, I mean, to, to my mind, you know, yeah. in a way. Whereas the third volume of Capital is much more interesting in the terms of what is financialization. And, you know, Mandel's introduction uh, is pretty damn good, the preface to the third volume. I don't know, have you ever read the third volume or looked at, you know, because this is the, the one that people, you know, first of all, Marx did not finish it, yeah, but he, he did, um, Engels put this together, you know, mostly. I but, started a class yeah. in the third volume, but it and who was, was teaching uh, it? Do you I did. It, yeah. it was years ago, but it was too complex for me to understand. Uh -huh. Right. Well, it, it's it's really about it, it's really about money in itself, right? I mean, that's that's you know what it's really doing is the fi financial finance capital. So th this is my I mean one of the basic ideas is that we would start with reading chapters 25 and 30 of, of, of Capital, Volume 3, which is fictitious capital. Yeah, 30, two chapters. Because in that, he defines fictitious capital, what it is. And just to give you a, a working definition of fictitious capital, fictitious capital really is about a future claim on earnings. It does not exist. It's very futural, right? That's why it's called fictitious. It has a future claim on earnings to come. And it's actually divorced, separated from the mode of production. This is why, you know, so you're dealing with a very high level Beth, of abstraction, right? I mean, there's a very high level of abstraction because no longer are you in circuits of commodity, money, commodity, or really, in, you know, in a way, you're in the circuit only of M prime that's really working here. It's about future capitalizations, you know, et cetera. Right? So this is what have, people have a very hard time. How is it that Amazon makes no money right, yeah. on the bottom line, but is one of the wealthiest capitalized companies in the world and their 
quote unquote chairman of the board is, you know, quote the richest, whatever, you know, I'm putting these highly in these little <laughs> long footnotes, you know, Mr. Bezos is the richest, you know, man in the world. So this is one 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 question, you know, we'll we'll take a look at is what is fictitious capital and then what is the banking component, what is really meant by money capital, loan capital, interest capital, and how this is working today, right? In a way. How does this contribute to financialization and to finance capital? So the second reading would be from George Zimmel, and we'll look at you know the question of value. Let me let me put this up, you know. The question of, of value and substance. Does money have value and substance? So we're going to look at this, and I'm going to—I'll I'll give you handouts of all this, you know, in case you because the philosophy of money, even though it's one of the great classics. Zimmel was a sociologist, friend of a, you know New Durkheim, you know, uh, was actually a teacher of Georgie Lukacs, um, you know, one of his teachers alongside of Max Weber, right? So Weber called this the greatest book on money. Whatever, you know, Max Weber, right? He was a great German sociologist. So we're going to look at this in terms of uh, value and uh, yeah, the chart is better uh, and substance, right? Does money have value? And what is value in a, in a sense? I mean, I've done this before, and I still kind of hold to this. You know, as we go into post-modernity, if you will, just as a dating device, you know, that we're kind of in the post modernist moment still. I mean, if you really look at the history of being, the history of ontology, you know, we're really looking at, at, at aspects. We have being as value, Marx, right? <laughs> we have Nietzsche being as power, and Freud being as desire. And all three seem to, you know, <laughs> interpenetrate each other, but you basically have three major thinkers, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, you know, that I've referred to in the past as the unholy uh, trinity. Well, is the microphone on or no? Yeah, it, it, it is. is. Okay, good, okay. Um, so, so in, a, in a way, you know, this question of value is the Marxist, is the Marxist uh, question, right? Is the, is the Marxist question, what is value and what is value form, right? So we're going to try to speak to this as well through readings in Zimmel. And then we'll go back, if you will, in, in uh, Hilferty, Rudolf Hilferty is part of the early um, Austrian Marxist school, right? Uh, a book called Finance Capital. And I, I put the pages here if you want to see if you can get it, or I can make photocopies. It's 75 pages on fictitious capital and the joint stock companies. So this will give you a kind of background, if you will, fundamentals, right, in the sense of what is fictitious capital, right? <laughs> what does it mean, you know, in, in the Marxist critical historical approach and analytic approach? How does it play out in the debate about imperialism? Because this Lenin has a debate with Hilferding on imperialism uh, that Hilferding really, in a way, I think has won the debate because now we're all about financialization and it's no longer really about imperialism. And in some ways, you can see, you know, in our, in our you know, Negre and Hart empire coming out of this as well, right? In terms of the arguments against, uh, you know, in our time, empire comes out in, right after the 9-11, uh, since you were talking about that earlier. Uh, 2001 Empire was their first of the four volumes, Empire, Multitude, Commonwealth, and now Assembly. Those are the four volumes that Negre and Hart have uh, written, you know, in, in another way. So you begin to see this, this coming out in terms of this and this working it out together and the new forms of internationalization, right? So we're going to try to trace that as well. Okay, on the other hand, I want to go through, um, um, you know, some of the fundamental um, uh, works on Wall Street itself, right? <laughs> I mean, Wall Street is really exists as a, uh, I should bring, a, my mother was very good with her hands. Uh, she did a needlepoint of Wall Street in 1784 <laughs> for a folder of me thinking I was going to make big money or whatever. I have no idea. But anyway, she was very talented. So I'll bring that in show. But yeah, Wall Street is basically a, a late 18th century. Yeah, that sorry. Helps. That helps. You put down the pages for Okay. Yeah, 107 to 182. Can you see this, everybody? Yeah, is that okay? Is it better or worse? Or worse? Hard to read it. 
It is? Because yeah. of the shade? Yeah. I mean, it's it's like uh, yeah. deflecting. Is the this better? This is clear. Mm -hmm. Is that better? That's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, we got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm good with light. <laughs> light, I know. Uh, I'm like a Plato's cave. Very active. Yeah. I know the light. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the symbol means? Zimel is, uh, I don't know the pages okay. yet, but I'm going to do, we're going to be on value and substance in particular, and maybe something about being and having and the relationship to money, you know, mm -hmm. being and having together, you know, the, you know what, what this meant. Because really in some senses, out of Zimel you get, you know, I mean, not, it's not coming from Zimel, but one thing you can do is look at Benjamin on the Arcades Project alongside, and these are ideas for, you know, future courses and stuff like that, but, you know, for our purpose, you could look at uh, Benjamin's Arcades project in the light of the psychology of money, the Arcades project, and you could also look at um, um, the notion of Marx's fetish, right, in this too, the fetishism of commodities, in both the Arcades project and the psychology of money, and of course Baudelaire's Flaneur, right? Yeah, the lyric poetry of high capitalism, right? The Flaneur as a type, the one that, and the dandy as a type, right? In terms of 19th century stuff, right? So anyway, th these are, you know, some things we could work with. Again, the political economy, you know, beginning with Marx, I want to start with a critical hyphen historical analytical framework, which is the critical moment where we acclimate ourselves to terms to understand, you know, objectively as much as possible where we are in terms of this notion of fictitious capital. Then the psychology of money, which is 1900. I mean, you know, he's writing this 1870s, you know, the third volume, eight, middle, middle to late 1870s. Marx dies 1883, right? And uh, with a copy of Aristotle's prior analytics in ancient Greek and is it in his reading chair. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is uh, this is going to be you know at least important. I mean, most a lot, lot of it that may be the same. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, talk Steve. to them so they don't press us again. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no problem. I'll wait till you get back. Yeah, yeah. Just so so um right anyway, there. and and then maybe a paper towel too, but not because I'm going to probably. Oh, I can so. grab it. Okay, and. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, going back to this, yes, um, that, you know, we'll, we'll try to, again, understand, you know, this notion of fictitious capital. What does it mean to create capital that does not really exist into the future? What does this mean in terms of, you know, our daily life? What does this mean in terms of, you know, the uh, capitalist mode of prediction as this book? comes out? What, what does this mean to the biopolitical? And another thing I want to mention, this could be enhanced. I mean, I know some of us, we looked at this a little bit um, in another class, the birth of bio, biopolitics lectures by Michel Foucault in 1978-79 at the Collège de France. You know, has a lot of the elements of the neoliberal moment where capital no longer is about capital wage labor relations, but capital takes on the new, the new um, uh, meaning of human capital. It's Becker and Company. Hey, Jim. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, yeah. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. That's all right. There's a you missed the good food, man. Hey, Mr. Okay. Lost. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, yeah. So I need a. a, a oh, this is it. This is it. Okay. Right. So, so anyway, um, so this would be the three quote unquote left readings, right, in, in a sense. And then what I want to do um, is go, um, I want to go through um, basically the post-World War II moment in Wall Street, right? I mean, we'll talk about joint stock companies, vertical horizontal trust, the building of fortunes, you know, what happened in the, the crash and, you know, certain kind of explanations about this. But what I'm really interested in to bring us up to date is the 1952 to 1973 period, you know, where we begin to shift, right, <laughs> completely in terms of theory about portfolio and stuff like that. So, yeah, I guess I should let it dry right before I write on it. You need yeah. another one? We can grab one and do that. 
Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that up. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I could, you know, help. Okay. Okay. Oh. I'll grab you another. Okay, I'll buy an eraser for next time. So, so anyway, um, um, so what I, what I want to do too, parallel to this, you know, and we'll we'll do this as much as we can, you know, as you know, for lack of a better term, dialectically as possible. You know, to try to look at this shaping of the modern Wall Street beginning in 1952 with uh, Markowitz's theory of portfolio management. This is the beginning of the models of diversification and portfolio allocation, right? That investing is a bet on the future. And this is his language, right? A bet on the future. Right? And this is the model that starts um, starts um, you know, portfolio management and construction. So this is 1952, and it's a man named Markowitz. <laughs> right, Harry Markowitz. And this is published in many of the business journals and actually works in Wall Street, where if you had money post-World War II, you would, you know, basically the brokers or the brokerage houses at that time, the big brokerage houses, obviously were Lehman Brothers, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, one of which no longer exists, <laughs> Dylan Reed, Merrill Lynch, Pierce Fenner and Smith, used to have a very much longer name. You know, you had many, many other, many of the WASP firms that are no longer in existence. Certainly J.P. Morgan and company, you know, et cetera, Morgan Stanley, all of these investment banking houses. And by the way, this is another interesting history as a sidelight. When Marx is doing all of this, you know, the Lehman Brothers come from Alabama. They were fruit merchants. They actually sold fruit <laughs> on, the, on, the, uh, on the streets, right, and then became merchants there. And then they moved to New York. They're out of Montgomery, Alabama, out of Alabama. And the Lazette Frere, of which Rohatton, you know, and company in the Municipal Assistance Corporation, all are New Orleans, you know, people who moved north. Right? So this is a very interesting moment where you had some southern Jews, right? As well as pirate Jews, the Lafitte brothers, who on the other side, this is very interesting <laughs> history, right? The Lafitte, Jean Lafitte, was a Jewish pirate who lived in New Orleans, built a bar, I mean, built a house for Napoleon to come to, called the Napoleon House, if you're ever in New Orleans, great place to go. But anyway, Lafitte ended up being exiled from the United States because his, his pirates, you know, took down a ship on which the governor's of Louisiana's daughter was on, and they sank it. So he was exiled from the country, even though he was absolutely crucial for the winning of the Battle of 1812 in New Orleans, uh -huh. the Battle of New Orleans, because he controlled the bayous where the British ships had to go through in order to bring weapons to fight, and he closed those off. So he was very essential to this. But Lafitte ended up in Manchester, England. Mm -hmm. later on and lived out his days and he met Engels and Paul Virilio the French um, uh, philosopher has discovered uh, you know that Lafitte may have been one of the early promoters and financiers of the manifesto of the Communist Party <laughs> so you have a Jewish pirate from Louisiana meeting Freddie Engels. You can't make this shit up. You can't make this shit up. Exactly. And yes, yes. Yeah, right, exactly. On the other hand, you have these other groups of people who are fruit merchants or, you know, basically other kinds of pirates in, the, in, in Louisiana, a lot of things there, that became major Wall Street firms, including Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was not always this you know, bankrupt uh, firm. You know, Bobby Lehman, by the way, used to have a private dining room at the house downtown on Wall Street. You know, he had 50 people that would work that private dining room. That's, that's how these people lived, right, in some ways, you know. So anyway, you have this, this movement of, uh, you know, this, this, you know, and, and Marx, you know, he speaks about this on the Jewish question, you know, in, in some ways, you know, he speaks to this without, quote, naming names, et cetera. So anyway, Going back to this, you know, you have these theories of, first of all, portfolio allocation, 
management and construction that begins this, this period from 52. And then there's a 1964, um, uh, well, actually 58, let me, uh, you have the Mogli Mogliana, Mogliani, uh, Mogliani, and this guy was at NYU. Um, um, and this was the theory of, cas of, of uh, corporate finance, right? The general theory of corporate finance. How do you keep financialization going and, you know, take care of the corporations? How does the banking and corporation, M-O-D-I-G-L-I-A-N-I, -I -I, right? Franco, he was Italian and he was at NYU, right? In 1958, I had 64, this is for the next model. So this was the theory of corporate finance. And how do you establish, right, this was, how do you establish what are called equilibrium? And, you know, these crises that we get go to in, you know, periodically, the last one, of course, being 2007, 2008, are really crises in equilibrium to these people. To these people. To us, it's a very different thing. But to them, they look at this as crises in equilibrium. That somehow the interest rates, somehow, <laughs> you know, something went amok in the system and you've got to bring it back to this kind of equilibrium, to this balance, right? And this is coming out of Franco Mogliani's thing. And people like Nouriel, I don't know if you remember Nouriel, Dr. Rubini. Doom Rubini, is out of the Mogliani school in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. It, it just yeah, strikes yeah, me yeah. that things have changed so much that now we've got the VIX that um, profits off the volatility. Yes. <coughs> uh, Beth is referring to what's called the volatility index, the VIX in, uh, index. So Wall Street reads very carefully if the VIX goes up so much, right? <laughs> this is signals, to, uh, you know, a possible disequilibrium and a shock to the system. And, you know, we're going to get more and more of these re readings as Trump's, you know, policies keep, uh, you know, happening. But that's know. become a profit center now. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, we're going to go into this when we get to the, quote, derivatives, which will be part of another another moment in this. So anyway, I'm just trying to give a little bit of this Wall Street history, if you will, alongside of the, the critical history, if you will. This is more descriptive, but it's also theoretical from their point of view. It's not the kind of theory we do, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a sense, which is critical and analytical. This is theory in order to generate more and more bourgeois economics, to generate equilibrium, to generate construction of, you know, I, I think that only um, um, about 35% of the uh, people in the United States are really in the pension system or in the financial system in terms of investing. The latest statistic I heard, which is very revealing to me, is... Um, So anyway, the latest statistic that's very revealing, 52% of the Princeton graduates want to go into investment banking. Wow. 52%. Over one half, one out of two people you walk on the Princeton campus, investment banking. What's that? You said 35 Well, 35% well, have a, a stake in, in a stake, yeah, the pension, okay. small stakes, I small see. investors, people so like our ARTA 401ks, you know, state uh, pension plans, etc. rotation of inherited capital, all these kind of things are, are operative in that, I think, in that statistic, you know. So, Do you remember where that comes from? Um, I think that's put out by the securities, you know, the, the, uh, that, that's a government uh, statistic, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, you know, you could play with that a bit, but yeah, yeah. I think it's fairly accurate when they, they look at things like that in terms of the analysis of household income and who has what, et cetera, et cetera. That does not, of course, take into account that by Tax Justice Network estimates there's about 27 to $31 trillion in offshore accounts which go very much into the, I mean, this is another thing, another levels of abstraction, that you have all this money offshore that may be moving through the system in varying degrees, sometimes as static, sometimes as dynamic, 
in the system. So this is another thing that's not really put into the statistics. How do you move the laundry, right, <laughs> into legitimating, you know, uh, stuff? You know, why is it that a shoe store that sells, you know, five pairs of shoes in Park Slope stay open for five years? Right? You know, somebody's, you know, got a laundry. Right? So the, 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 these are things that are, you know, that are hidden, very much hidden from the actual system itself. You know? So, I mean, what I'm giving you is the visible here. So then there's something called in Bill Sharp, after Magliani, is the next person that's, you know, essential, essential to this. In 1964, Bill Sharp gets an asset pricing model. And this, you know, this asset pricing model begins to help value stocks and bonds, right? Et cetera, right? This is, this is a new thing. It's called the capital. I mean, really, the capital uh, uh, um, 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 asset pricing model, right? Capital asset pricing model. So, just look at the difference here. In a way, we were going to deal with we were going to deal with value and substance, and the question of being is value. They're interested in price versus value, right? <laughs> in a sense, you know, they're also interested in a very different notion of value, right? So this is this is again a, a good thing to keep in mind that value for them is how do you put capital, how do you value assets, right? How does this work in terms of a new model? So that's also, and then in 1965, um, and this is something that Greenspan always used, was the efficient market hypothesis. That markets and market economy will ultimately regulate themselves, and you can't beat them, but you can play them. Right, the efficient market hypothesis. And this was developed by a guy named, <laughs> ironically, his name means fame in Latin, Eugene Fama is his name, yeah. He invented the efficient market hypothesis, and this is where, um, 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 you know, Greenspan and other, the market is hard, hard to beat, right? You cannot beat the market. The house always wins in casino logic, right? I mean, this was always the thing. That's an efficient market hypothesis. The market is always right, right? <laughs> and the this was out always right. Always right. Yeah, yeah. The market will correct everything. Yeah. Good move, huh, Jim? Yes. Yeah. This yeah. is before algorithms. <laughs> no, not before. The algorithms are working, but not to the degree. Yes. Now, the algorithm is invented many years, you know, I mean, as Sean, you know, as we know in the history of mathematics, algorithms were used multiple times. Yeah. Now it's a very different kind of thing where you have machines taking over from the human element. When I used to go visit my friend, you know, his name was Barton, uh, Hebert, the polio victim. You know, you used to have the ticker tape. You remember, you'd go by, and you'd have the ticker tape. He would read, be a tape reader. And you, you know, you would train your eye to read the tape, and you could see, if you were really good at this, you could read between the lines and see who's buying, where the subtleties are. You're reading, you're basically reading, you know, movement of buying and selling in an auction. You know, and you're, you're trying to pick up on this. In, in a sense, as a speculator, right? Today, you know, that human element, and there was an art to that. I mean, I, I, you know, I've seen this at work where people understand that 20,000 shares at $20.50 being bought there might be an indication that that stock's going from 2050 to 23 in the next three days. You know, they could, they, some of these guys could pick up on this. They were instinctively you know, and, and uh, intuitively kind of uh, attuned, if you will, to this, this kind of phenomenon. They can see the patterns. Yeah, they can understand the patterns and they can project those patterns mm -hmm. into the future in, in many ways. Yes, they would pick up on the patterns. Hmm. So, so uh, but now, I mean, most of, you know, I think over 80% of the training is done by machines. And we're going to talk about this, about the intrinsic and the extrinsic and how Wall Street, you know, relates to external events and how sensitive it's become because the machine is sensitive to news, right? And that sometimes the real task, if you want to, quote, make money or you want to, you know, kind of, you know, survive in that game, you have to be able to read, you know, what's, what's being hidden, right? Where is there still value 
right? <laughs> is there still some kind of asset pricing model that's out skewed in a different way? So you can see people like Warren Buffett, for example, who's a quote value investor, comes out of the Benjamin Graham School of Security Analysis. Benjamin Graham was a professor of finance at, at Columbia. And he, um, he taught Buffett. Buffett went to Columbia Business School, the, the university. And Buffett is always looking for, you know, how do I model capital assets? How, what does price mean? So for example, he figured out that Geico was tremendously undervalued based on this model of capital, capital asset pricing model and value-wise, right, in terms of how they do things. So he picked up the Geico for what today looks like about two cents on the dollar, right? And this was one of his big investments of Berkshire Hathaway that made him Warren Buffett. You know, there were other situations, too, that had done this, but this was his mode of operating, in a sense. Whereas you've got people, I mean, and I can go through this, but these are some of the players. You have Ray Diallo, you know, who has the box, you know, you know, everybody has to report to Ray, you know, and they have this kind of like instant communication, instant criticism. It's like, you know, these old stupid encounter groups where you're constantly being encountered, you know, about what, why are you making those decisions? Explain yourself, explain yourself, explain yourself. So Diallo is another thing. And of course, then you have the Mercer family, you know, the ones behind, you know, quote unquote, Cambridge Analytica and Trump and, you know, and, uh, you know, the whole uh, fake news culture. The Mercer family, you know, especially her father, Rebecca, obviously is in charge of the media aspect, but her father was the mathematician. So they all come, we'll talk more about this, but I'm trying to give you, these are certain models out of which the background comes. Now going back to the BIX, 1973, uh, Schiller, Scholes, Black, um, um, Robert Merton come up with the theory of option pricing. And this is crucial in the early 70s. 73 is the year it comes out, but they're writing it as early as 71, 72. So the Scholes Black model of how do you price, and this is the beginning of a new form of derivatives. Even though derivatives are operated in 19th century commodity futures trading, because you needed to hedge against weather, <laughs> against bad crops. There was a necessity there. But in stocks, <laughs> right, this became part of a real fiction, a new fictitious game in which the casino starts to really emerge, right? And this is 73, and the, the historic event that makes this possible, of course, is Breton Woods, where Nixon takes us off in August of 1970. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. 1971. So 1971 takes us off of the uh, gold standard and the dollar becomes the floating currency, right. no longer backed by value, <laughs> right? The value of gold. Gold is no longer valuable. And gold at that time was $35 an ounce, well over $1,000 an ounce now, as high as 1900 To give you an idea of what people think, you know, how do you really price this into this system? Why is gold no longer at the base, but it's so valuable <laughs> compared to its price, you know, 40 years ago? These what are, these are good mean, questions. What does that mean, Michael? What does what mean? I'm sorry. How does it, this kind of value when it's no longer the standard? Well, I mean, it means that people think that uh, these things need to be valued. They need to, they need some kind of basis, you know? So, so there's people that are called gold bugs. They go and buy gold every time there's a crisis, and they think that, you know, it's these currencies need to be tied, tied to something, right? They need to be tied to, to, to something like gold, right? as this model. And gold, of course, as you know, since Amsterdam, the first stock exchange was in Amsterdam, 1603, I think, you know, right during the time of uh, Spinoza, Descartes, <laughs> you know, the, the advent of philosophical modernity is the first stock exchange. The East Indies Company, for example, was offering a lot of the, you know, well, paper, you know, the, the new paper economy. Of which Marx, again, you know, Althusser is interesting in the sense of you don't read capital through the commodity, you begin with a section on money. That's what he thought, because that really marked the system differently, you know, to begin with that. 
really set us up, you know. But I mean, that, that's another another story, right? So, so anyway, the Shoals and Black model gave you a new kind of uh, a situation for for um, pricing derivatives. So you would buy what would be a call or a put, right? A call would be, you would be betting on a stock within a given period of time to go up a particular amount of. Uh, you know, it would be so, to these are time bases, right? Well, this was a sub thing to, you know, the derivative really means it's derived for something. So you would buy a call, say General Motors is $25 a share, you think it's going to be 30, and you think it would be 30 in six months. So you make it bet by putting up some money to bet that it will hit 30. You know, you don't pay the full premium, but there was a premium put in that is time bound, right? So this was, you would bet on the rise up. The other aspect was called the put. That means you would bet it would go down. Mm -hmm. That was part of the short mentality. So calls and puts and model pricing is created by the Black-Scholes model, right? At, at this point. And this is going on at Yale, you know, I mean, just to give you an idea, at the same time David Geffen of Electro Asylum Records, right? who is now way beyond that, but anyway, he's giving lectures at Yale too on in the, at the business school and drawing thousands of students, whereas Marcusa and others are kind of fading in the, in the background. I mean, I'm doing this, you know, kind of Hollywood style in the sense that, you know, these are moments, at least to my mind, that are very crucial in terms of the direction of the United States and the left. Right? In some ways. You know, by 73, by 76, you know, I always tease Stanley, but I think it's a good, I think it's accurate that 73 marked really the high point of the left, but also the beginning of its decline. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you published False Promises that year. Your friend Jameson published Prison House of Language, Marxism and Form, and our mutual friend, uh, uh, um, Anthony uh, Wilden published System and Structure. Three major books, theoretical interventions on the left in 73, but at the same time, OPEC raises the price of oil. There's no accident <laughs> that this is coming out in 73 because OPEC is also raises the price of oil 300%. Some of us are old enough to remember that going to the gas station, that all of a sudden 35 cent gasoline was 99 cents and then we went over a dollar. and. You know, then we went to the self-serve pumps and right? well, you bought an even uh, license plate. Right, exactly. And this was the advent of inflation. I don't know how many of you have also seen the movie, uh, Jonah Will Be 25 in the Year 2000. Beautiful film by Elaine Tanner, of which the uh, Ma uh, Matthew is his name, one of the characters, is uh, giving a very beautiful lecture about inflation, the working class guy. You know, you had the, the kind of battered revolutionary, sausage. the blood sausage was the historian, yeah. Mario, yeah. Mario, who, you know, had the girlfriend who, who was checking out the seniors for no money at the, uh, <laughs> at the uh, grocery store, right? It was good at the supermarket. But anyway, in that, there's a nice, you know, take on inflation. You know, this is a film, 76. You know, that inflation also starts too, and we begin to talk in the world, word, words of, you know, the semiotics of it's conflated, it's inflated, it's deflated. This becomes part of the normative, you know, vocabulary of this period. But at the same time, this is where Wall Street is making this shift, if you will, from just, you know, common preferred stock, <laughs> right, bonds, you know, uh, different forms of corporate debt based on the corporate finance model, this is shaken up by this new derivative moment. And this is the advent of, in Chicago, it's called the Chicago Board Options Exchange, the CBOE, which is right next to the Chicago, you know, uh, Commodity Exchange, to the, C, the Chicago Board of Trade, you know, which, you know, um, um, Breck wrote, uh, of course, Jungle of the Cities, right? Yeah, you know, great play about Chicago. You know, the city of broad shoulders called Sandberg, right? And the commodity traders you know, in, in, in Chicago. So anyway, this is all going on, you know, 73. So this model of 21 years kind of sets up the new Wall Street, hmm. you know, if you will, right? That you have these, these courses, corporate finance as a, as a model, uh, you know, bet, uh, the bets on the future, um, you know, the um, Mogliani, 
theory of, of, of this, the capital asset pricing model, the efficient market hypothesis that the markets do not lie, the market economy is determinant, right? In the last analysis, the markets know best. And then you have the derivative, the, the option pricing model. Of what the, this, is, this is the theory of option pricing. Let me just put it here, the theory of option pricing. And I've just given you the puts and calls, but they have things like straddles, you know, and you can think of the stupid language that they use on Wall Street, you know, they have, where you play both sides. You're straddling the fence or whatever, right? You have, you pay both the long side and the short side together. And this is where the hedge, hedge funds. So the hedge funds, you know, are not really so operative in the 50s or really in the early 60s, but the hedge funds begin, you know, where we, we use this as common language, but Soros, Rogers, a lot of the hedge funds begin in the late 60s, right? Right before the derivative markets, right? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Where does penny stocks fit into this? Penny stocks? Yeah. Well, it's just a form of investment. A penny stock refers to a stock that is a price below $5. And so why was Millican, why was he? Who's this? The, Michael Millican. Oh, why were they interested in betting stocks? I mean, they're volatile. I mean, look, I, I bought one of these marijuana firms, Leaf by Technology. <laughs> they put together, they put together, it's a, yeah. Get LB, it on the ground floor. Yeah, I'm on the ground floor. <laughs> L-B-U-I, yeah, I bought from my, my nieces and nephews, right? L-B-U-I, right? Leaf by Technology. And they put together dealer and, and uh, you know, a customer, right? They have very sophisticated technology, right? And it's a penny stock. You know, it goes from 98 cents to about $4. So you have a tremendous rate, you know, you have to remember, this is based on the logic of percentage, right? How much percentage return on capital, you know, and return on equity are you gonna get? So the penny stocks are attractive in that way because if a stock goes from one to two, it doubles, you know? If General Motors goes from 20 to 30, that's only 33 and a third percent. You know, you have a much better chance, right, in terms of these penny stocks and the hype around them, et cetera. So the Wolf of Wall Street, the movie, if you look at that, the DiCaprio character, is part of the penny stock phenomenon. Hi, I've got this great deal for, you know, you know, you know the routine, right, et cetera. Milk, and, you know, in other words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, um, yeah. So that, that, the penny stocks really refer to stocks in which you can make a great lose your shirt, or make a great return because of the cheapness of them. And if you get a little move, my move, it'll double or triple but wasn't easily. Wasn't that the, the seduction of working people uh, into the stock market? I mean, not big, big players, but the little players? And the well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the individual investor, you know, the small investor. And, and again, Wall Street's not foolish. They keep indexes on these people. They, they show how many small investors are going into the market and staying out. So they have that data to work with. And, you know, that's considered a contrarian move. If there are too many small investors buying stocks at a certain point, it means you get out. You know, <laughs> they're wrong. You know? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is what Wall, how Wall Street interprets this, you know, in general. Right? Yeah. So they have these indexes, which are called, I mean, look, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this more in depth, but, you know, this is just a kind of introductory. The sentiment, sentiment indexes, right? Huh. Are people, sentiment. yeah, a sentiment index. So you have to, again, realize that this is very much based on statistical, you know, probability, right? This is a theory of probability, always operative. It's 17th century in that sense that some people like Diallo, Mercer, think they can get to exactitude, right? That's the drive always. You know, the, the Robin Hood people, Paul Tudor Jones, all these people who have been very, quote, successful monetarily in this, are thinking that they can perfect these probability or, or reduce the level of probability to making, you know, tremendous returns on capital. So, for example, I mean, I, I've, I've looked at this. You know, a million dollars with Soros in 1970 is worth about 80 million today. It's better than real estate. It's better than, you know, or 10,000 with Soros. You can do the math. It's worth almost a million dollars, 
right? So these are these are the expectations, and part of obviously the seduction. When people hear this stuff, oh, who's your you know who who's managing? Who's your broker? Who's doing the, you know this for you? And you know half of the academics are checking out their TIAA you know crap all the time, you know all, all the time, you know and. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Stanley went into cash. He still talks about that moment, the corner of 2001. But the problem with Stanley is he could have had three times the money if he had gone back in, but he never went back in. He played it safe the whole time. But it's okay. He's doing all right. You know? <laughs> okay. but, but anyway, yeah. So, so um, yeah, so they have, you know, what you when you use penny stocks, you know, I mean, the sentiment index is something that people look at. You know, if the sentiment is very high, they have something called the contrarian indexes, right? That they're, they're the contrarian I investors. And this is a guy named uh, O'Neill. Yeah, the contrarian. Right? <laughs> this is hilarious. Yeah, it is hilarious. <laughs> I know. It, it's very funny. I mean, it is. It's, it's really, you're, you're really reading history as farce here. However, it's a serious, it's a very serious farce. Very serious farce. It affects us, every one of us, in our everyday lives to a degree. Right? To a degree. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we, we really have become, in this moment, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, talk about this, the financialization of everyday life. Of everyday life. Yeah? In so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, in, in a way, you know, and this is the title of a book of, uh, you know, Randy Martin, who was a friend of ours who uh, passed away a couple of years ago uh, from brain cancer, but a very good book, and, you know, he also did some work. I, I think it's a bit, you know, too, uh, too somewhat confused, but it's interesting, the social logic of the derivative. You know, he wants to show how uh, kind of social effects are coming out of this, you know, emphasis upon derivatives. So you ask the question, why is it that I can have an apartment, and some of you are in this boat in New York City, I'm here in, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here the summer of 76, 78, you know, I'm paying 200 for a one bedroom on the Upper West Side or a little less, right? Why is it that you, we could do that? What makes that $200 a month apartment, which was probably in better shape in some ways back then, now 3,500 or even more? I'm, I'm being conservative, huh? Yeah, yeah. One day, not two. Really? Okay. <laughs> so where does this 2,000% increase come from? Is it value? No. Right? What, what is really going on that has mm -hmm. produced this kind of effect? And, and obviously, you know, not only the real estate, but also, you know, this creation of the stock market. You know, during Richard Nixon's time, when it hit 1,000 on the Dow, that was the greatest moment ever, right? In some ways, in the history of stock market. Back here, when they're writing this stuff in before 73, the stock market's in 1,000, 1,200, the Dow. You know, it's closing with Trump at 20, 21, you know, 23,000 now, right? Yeah. So where, where does this, how is this being created is a, is a real, I think a very crucial question. Whether we answer it or not is another story, but at least this is on a level of abstraction that is really affecting us. You know, you would have gone to City College for free 35, 40 years ago, like this, nothing. You know, and you probably would have gotten a much better education too. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, and now you're going to go back, you're going to pay a little sum, I'm sure, you know. You'll pay some of the tuition. You know, why is this happening? And listen, listen, 1973 is a New York City fiscal crisis. Remember Gerald Ford yes. of the, uh, the front of the paper, you know, dropped dead to city. <laughs> Ford, excuse me, to, to, to the city. And, uh, you know, so this is all, you know, yeah. A bankruptcies of cities, the neglect of cities, white flight even more than the city. You know, the 70s was a big time about white flight, you know as well yeah so th this is a to me a, a real marker going forward of course this changes again you know you start getting people like i mean and i'm doing a, a very you know obviously general history through dateability here but you know 1995 blythe masters comes up with the credit default swaps you know which is the part of the new you know kind of model for the derivative right which was part of the, you know, the creation of the subprime mortgage crisis, 
which is played out very brilliantly. Blythe Masters is her name, B-L-Y-T-H-E, Masters. Yeah, and uh, it was called Credit Default Swaps. She brought this to the brokerage houses. She created this. When was that? Time? 1995, Clinton, on Clinton's watch. Mm. Yeah. And what was the year that uh, GM became more a financial corporation than a car corporation? Well, about all of the uh, automobile corporations became what were called GM credit. Right. Became more than GM production. But when was that? This switch? this this switch really started in the 70s. Yeah, it started. It got more and more so later, but you had GE credit, you know, as well, too. Yeah. You know, you went through all of these kind of models based on somewhat on the, the whole thing of this, this model here, modified this theory of corporate finance. You know, not only do you make something, but you finance it. So you're not only, the, you know, and Apple is a bank now. Bank, Apple has uh, $50 billion in cash. Hmm. You know, so it's become a kind of credit company, even though it's not, you know, really out there giving credit to its customers. You don't buy from Apple the computer on time, right? <laughs> or through Apple credit, you buy it through, you know, PayPal or, you know, pay, buy it now, pay later, you know, or through certain credit cards and stuff like that. And you get, you know, academic discounts, but Apple has not gone into that market yet. You know, on the iPhone or on the, th yeah, because they really think people will continue to buy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Amazon it's such certainly a, has. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Amazon's, the, I mean, Amazon is really your virtual corporation at this point. I mean, it's the model for virtuality. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, I mean, I brought the Wall Street Journal and Beth has it too, but there's a whole side, and, and Chris, um, that, um, in the Wall Street Journal, there's a section on Walmart and Amazon, right? <laughs> yeah, so you can, you begin to see this, too. So another thing I would like to do, I mean, you know, I asked you to bring, I mean, I know this is $5, but maybe for the first two sessions, we could look at the way, not the news is, we already know how the news is constituted here, but how they, they, they actually, the tables, how to deconstruct the tables and all of that and why, See, Walmart has new passage to India, and this is their new competition with Amazon. So this is what these people are reading on the weekends. They're not only reading the Harvard Business Review, in which is you know, usually about how to destroy unions and you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, but they're reading you know, this all the time. Yeah, the new science of psychedelics. Right. Well, Wall Street wants to trip again. Oh, yeah. 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 You know this, right? So I mean, much money you made in Iowa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trips exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And what people forget in these derivatives, and we'll talk more about this, what's coming out now are the carbon futures, you know, the carbon futures that basically Wall Street will make money on sustainability. When you hear the word sustainability, that's a new form of profit making for Wall Street. It's a new, 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 new form of, uh, if you will, of, um, of a derivative. You know, the carbon banks. You know, the carbon banks that are going on. And this is very interesting, you know, and they're making money. These are trading, trading of vehicles. Yes? Where does Musk fit into this? Um, well, he's part of that class. I mean, I don't know what, well, yeah. he what do you he, mean? He comes in with all contrary ideas. Um, just want you don't want to yeah. No, I don't. I mean, I yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah he's, he's pretty much. Uh, yeah, he's pretty mainstream these days. No, well, his capital saying? asset pricing model, pretty much, right? My ideas will have this much value in the long term. Yes, I mean, he's investing. playing on a combination. Listen, if you take something like this and then you merge it with the Chicago School of Economics, you know, again. I mean, the way to, I mean, at least think about this, and I'm developing this parallelism, you also have universities that are coming up with theories about human capital. So right. you have Becker at the University of Chicago, who's sitting next to Uncle Milty Friedman, who's <laughs> developing monetary policy, and no longer, and the shift here, the reason I bring this up is the shift after World War II is from a Keynesian fiscal policy, right, of which maybe the Great Society was a shadow of, you know, of Johnson's Great Society. The shift is really to monetary policy. Everything is based on the cost of money. You know, this is why, you know, I bring a, you know, this, uh, what was the image I had here? Yeah, this is it. Uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, no, that's, that's the guy 
yeah, world is bracing, this era of easy money is, is easy, right? This is always the logic why the markets go down, because the cost of money is going to go up. Inflation. Yes, like right, back back in there, mm -hmm. right? In, 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 in a sense. So alongside of this, you have academics like Schiller, Irrational Economics at Yale. Mm -hmm. You have Capitalism and Freedom, being written by Friedman at, um, at, Ch at Chicago. You know, many of these things. Our friends, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Bob um, um, Meister. Meister at, uh, in uh, Santa Cruz on capitalism and the future, right? They're, they're actually looking at markets and, you know, I mean, they're reformists ultimately, Minsky? in my opinion. Minsky, Minsky, Minsky uh, Hyman Minsky is a, is a major player on credit expansion, okay. you know, cycles of credit expansion. Right now, we're probably going to go into pro credit uh, contraction. You know, the, the logic of academics today is that you need to create a world in which graduation rates are increasing and that student debt, you know, can be addressed. That's all they care about. They don't care about education. This is the model that is happening. You know, how fast will kids graduate and will they be able to pay the debt back? This is really, this is the new model. So it's sustainable. Yes, it's a sustainable model. Yes. Student debt, right. But also, so money can be made off that debt. Oh, oh, absolutely, right. and also, also that th this is more than the credit card debt. Yeah, they figured this out. So now they're using all these agencies, such as middle states. You know, this is the problem at LIU. I mean, our faculty is uh, incredibly stupid, and I'll, I'll say that even louder for you. <laughs> 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 right, right. Anyway, that they can't figure out that the whole thing about authorizing a contract of labor peace, well, actually labor capitulation, is a way of saying, yes, let's be run by statistics and by governmental policy that basically is trying to address only student debt. That's all they care about. It's not education anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Me Meister comes yeah. out of Harvard. Yeah, Meister's out of the Harvard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so anyway, all to say is that that, you know, again, this is about risk and risk management, right? In a sense. When Robert Bubin goes on Charlie Rose, when Charlie Rose still has a TV program, I think he's got a new one, but anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, but anyway, that, that he went on and said, you know, we're, we're taking existential risks by trading. Yeah, 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 they're financial <laughs> at our behalf, right? And he said, you know, we're, we're ones that are existentially, you know, Rubin said this during the Clinton uh, years. Right? Do they take existential yeah, yeah, risk? Yeah, yeah. The risk management is really the, the whole model, and this is one of the reasons that Wall Street is hiring, you know, mathematicians and the whole culture of quants. You know, the quants, the quant culture. You know, which is very funny, by the way, in uh, in the Big Short, the little so Japanese. Uh, he doesn't speak English, but he can do the math. <laughs> which is great. Meanwhile, he's third generation. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The reason I brought up uh, Musk, I, yeah. heard, I heard him speak recently. Okay. Where, where she was talking about art of, the danger of artificial intelligence. And Look at a really dark warning about it, and I wondered what role, if any, does artificial intelligence play in this machine? Well, oh, totally. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the machine, so, the machine is determining not so much here. You know, a person like me who's pretty good, I'm pretty good at you know sorting out the mathematics quickly, right? I mean, at least on the you know divisive on the division and you know uh, elementary equations. So back here, I could do things with this. Today, I'm up against the machine, yeah. right? And the machine is doing this pricing into the markets. And I, so I'm playing not only against the competitors who are buying and selling in this general auction, but I'm also playing against the machine that's programmed to do certain things and then has the flexibility. So it's like you're playing chess three times, you're playing three games of chess. You know, with your own mind, right? With the mind of the machine, the artificial intelligence, and with the mind of the people that are competing, competing with you. Some saying it's not going up, some saying it's going down, some saying it's only going up this much. And you know, the, and then you get into this whole Wall Street theory. I mean, and this is the way they think too. The other theory is never, you know, there's always going to be a greater fool. 
That's the theory of Wall Street. There's a greater fool to pay a higher price. Always the greater fool will come along. Yeah. This is the Ponzi scheme. There's always a greater fool. And you know, so there's a greater fool in real estate. You'll pay one million for your place, but someone down the road's going to pay 1.5 million. You know, have a friend Fort Green, six hundred and twenty-five thousand. They paid for the place. It's worth one point three point five million. You know, four years later. Yeah, yeah. it goes so, up yeah, fast. Yeah, and it goes up fast. This right, one, right, right, in a sense, in this market. So there's a greater fool willing to pay this higher price. The same thing with uh, you know, and again, Netflix. Right, people are greater fools to pay two hundred dollars per share versus one hundred and twenty. Right. The people at 120 are laughing all the way to the bank. The people at 200 may get it to 300, thinking there's another greater fool in the future. So this is part of the, the level of the expectational model that there's always a greater fool down the road. And this is the way capitalism, I mean, obviously, at this level is operating. There will be a greater fool down the road. So, so people like Musk, in terms of artificial intelligence, I mean, this is like, to my mind, at least, this is like listening to the kid in the locker room in ninth grade. Oh, this is horrible, this right. artificial intelligence, and all of this, because it's much more sophisticated than, you know, he's... Because it relies yeah. on basically s selling a story, right? So yeah. this, yeah. people don't really know what AI is, but we've had so many That's movies right. about this thing called AI. And you don't know the difference between like, you know, what was the two versions, um, smart AI or whatever it is, um, and the map behind it and how that's been nearly impossible versus mm -hmm. the little things we can do now. Yeah. But if you sell a story, this is where I think the, the student cr debt crisis or uh, uh, school crisis is going to have a little problem because they're up against, the optics are school debt is impossible, you don't need to go to school anymore. So I don't know how the academics are going to be able to deal with that model of getting more people into school. Well, I think what's going to really happen is is the only way out of this for the, the system is to really go, tr concentrate on vocational and apprentice like training for people that can't go to school. And then you begin you to say, we to have a program for infrastructure. See, if I were advising Trump, I'd say, you got a bonanza in front of you. Right. You know, take, you know, of the 15 million people in, in, in universities, you know, probably 6 million of them don't belong there. You know, what are we going to do with this, this group of people? Well, we're going to give them skill, right? We're going to build training programs. We're going to, and speaking of training, why not a public uh, transportation well, system, you know, for done. another million? Yeah, exactly. This is not, I'm not being original here. No, you have many models that are always already out there. You know, so that's what I would do if I was advising, you know, this fool. But anyway, right, right. yeah, another thing. Yeah, so yes, I mean, that that's the future of, of, um, of um, you know, of education, yes, is going to be towards vocational. How many healthcare professionals do you need? We have to ask that question at LIU, since everything is going towards, quote, health sciences, whatever science of health means. Right, 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 in a <laughs> certain way. Where is the science? Okay, the <laughs> yes, well, that's the interesting thing. LIU is connected to the Paul Corporation, which has pharmaceutical, you know, I mean, it's not, it, there's a lot of interconnectedness there that goes with its, you know, pharmacy school and its health sciences. But we, also, so, yeah, but we still need to do, uh, make sure our elementary and secondary education is beefed up or else we won't be able to get the researchers we need. Well, that, the, I think the researchers are going to be coming from other countries. I mean, you know, that, that seems to be oh, yeah. more and more the case. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at least in terms of, you know, you ever pick up the phone to get your computer fixed? Uh, H2B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you say again? Are you speaking that? What, what is that English word you uh, use? Yeah. It's but anyway, yes, I know. It's, it's, but, yeah. But I mean, uh, yes, of course. I mean, you know, right. what, what's going on in the high schools? And, you know, again, the, I mean, we, we've talked about this in other classes, you know, Bernard Stiegler's work on the digital economy and, you know, what he would call the economy. You know, capitalism has become the economy of carelessness. You know, it's totally careless at this point, right, in a sense, you know, and, and uh, you know, you, you read, you know, the, you know, the climate change, you know, where we are, you know, in terms of this keeps going on with carboniferous 
fossil fuel based uh, capitalism. So yeah, I mean, you know, the reversal is another story. So the people around Trump and these people advising like Cudlow and these idiots are really basically still stick stuck in these models of asset pricing. I mean, this stuff is very archaic today. It's been good for even them, though, right? yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It's been good for them. It's been good for yes, them. of course it's yeah. been. Well, yeah, it's been good for them. You know, on the bottom line, whether it's going to be good for their breathing is another another story. <laughs> going forward, right. So, so anyway, I mean, you know, again, you know, you're 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 looking at something that has become very dominant, right? I mean, through let's say, post-World War II, over 60-something years, right, of gyrations. You know, you've had bad markets, et cetera. You've had good markets. In general, if you put money in the stock market and just play in a basket of Dow Industrials, you know, you'd be pretty well off, you know, with, you know, $10,000 invested. You'd have a, a cushy pension, you know, if you had started back then. None of us were, you know, I was, you know, I was just thinking yeah, about that. Pretty that close point. to the womb, but, but anyway. But anyway, um, yeah, nobody's thinking this way, you know, during this period. So, so anyway, and we've gone through many, many things, but the amazing thing is that in 73, the market is around 1,000, now it's over 22,000, right? <laughs> and, you know, and got as high as 26,000 on the Dow, which is one of indexes. We'll, we'll go over this. This, this, these notions, right? The indexicals that Wall Street uses and interprets, because this is a, you know, basically what you're dealing with is kind of a, a strategy of statistical wisdom, right? How do you interpret statistics? How does the machine interpret statistics? You know, because for example, I, I and Arto bought some Micron Technology is a, a company that makes, is one of the biggest semiconductors. Semiconductors to me is the commodity that drives technology. The chips, right. the makers of the chips, mm -hmm. right? And they have, they, they have a control of a market called, you know, um, um, random DRAM, you know, dynamic random access memory. And they also have something called NAN. So they're making these factories, et cetera. It's been on a tremendous upswing right now. But then when you begin to look at the asset pricing model, it could be undervalued at this point. The problem is that, you know, most of Wall Street, because of sentiment and the trading systems, are saying this can't last. <laughs> this cycle will not last. So they're pulling the price down. So if you're thinking of a market as a rational thing, where this, this company is really making, making, you know, enormous profits, right? during this time, and it should go up in price. You're playing against the machine that has a historical sentiment, right? And also a lot of other things factored into it that is making trading programs sell it. Right? So this is why markets are very hard to beat, you know? Because you have these differing sentiments at work and these different kind of programs clashing with each other. So this, this is another, another story. So it's not such an easy game that you're smart enough to figure out where the assets are, where the resources are, how good is management, how good are the products. It also has these other you know, factors that are always going in that are somehow unmeasurable, you know, you know uh, vis a vis the machine, right? How, how, do you, how do you play off of that? So th this becomes a real, real question, and you know the, the, uh, the, the, the you know, in, in a way, the philosophy, you know, what does philosophy do? It tries to give a new theoretical, you know, construct to work with. That's what it really does, and it asks the question: What is money, and how does it function? How is money, and what is it? Right? These are the two questions that someone like Marx is a asking throughout Capital. Right? I mean, you know, in, in fact, this third volume should be called Money. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my mind's a little lot of fun. Yeah, please. What about the impact of the factor of time in terms of the ultra-high-speed trading yes. that's going on where you're using increments of a second to get ahead, right. and it's very gamed. Yeah. So if you can't use those networks, you don't get ahead of the trade. No, you don't. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you invested in 52, you weren't competing with no. that kind if of you thing. invested in 73, you weren't competing yeah. with Even during the Clinton years, you weren't, uh, you know, in the 90s. 
Yeah. You weren't doing this so much. I mean, it was beginning then, but it wasn't not, not like but today. Traits so right now, the traits are nanoseconds. And, and my thinking nanoseconds, about capitalism yeah. now is that what capitalism, it's no longer a Promethean moment, right, where you want to take the you know, knowledge from the gods or a Faustian bargain with the devil, you know, that you're going to have these urges that you ultimately will conquer everything. It's really about the mastery of speed. This is really what it's about. How are we going to get to the speed of light, you know, in terms of the economic moment? And economic control, this is really the economic war that they've been able to pull off. You know, they, they, they got a taste of what guerrilla, urban guerrilla warfare might be in the 70s, you know, late 60s and 70s in some ways, you know, when Detroit burns and, you know, they have in Baltimore, you know, the Panthers, the Black Liberation, and thank good Herman Bell got out of jail last week. That was very good, you know, to see him finally, you know, get out after many attempts. But, but anyway, all, all to say, yes, I mean, now the, the really the speed is really the, what you're going against, right? So you're like this on the movement, you know, because you can get, you know, I mean, look, I watch this sometimes. I'll, I'll try, you know, I'll look at a computer and I'll put in buy 200 shares of something at 2018 when it's bid at 2020. And then I'll watch the fluctuations, how quickly this happens in highly volatile stocks. It, I mean, it's, it's faster than any human being can, can do this kind of stuff, right? So this is what, 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 you're, what you're up against. Then the question is, how, well, how do you adjust your temporality? If you're in the game of speculation, right? How do you adjust the temporality to deal with this, right? You start thinking longer term. Because you can't, day trading is almost impossible unless you're in front of the screen all day long and you know every pattern about the stock and mm -hmm. how it reacts to everything. Which I guess you could master if you study one to five stocks and their patterns during the day, right. times of day, how they react to news. And then again, as I think Beth is pointing out, you know, the, the, the other enemy here is short termism. Right. Everything is based on the short term, quarter to quarter in terms of earnings reports, you know, day to day stuff. All you have to do is look at a newspaper like this and there's something about what is expected of a corporation. I wonder if the yeah. speed hides what they're really doing. I don't, I have suspicion that the quick trades are to create value to play both sides. Well, I don't know about value. No, I mean, sorry, I'm using, price. I'm using price. wrong words. Yeah, yeah, price. Yeah. But, but yeah. it seems like it's a shell game. Like, I will buy when it's low, but I also force it to be high so I can, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and back. Well, sure. Skin, that, I mean, people off. can do that. I mean, if you're putting I mean, with enough people, capital, you can start to pick up. Not people, but the, the yeah. sort of the, the machines. The machines, yeah. Machines, yeah, they're right? programmed to do something. Right, Mercer, right. Mercer has mathematical models like that. I mean, maybe later we'll go into this and kind of study how one of these firms really operates and kind of be interesting to look at what their mathematical model. These, these are people that were trained in, arm, in the Army. They were systems operators in the U.S. You know, armed forces. Well, the best, guys, they the, the best yeah. guys for the high-speed trading are the Russians. Yes. <laughs> and if you want to know about high-speed trading, it's a real revolution. Flash Boys is the book. I know Michael Lewis is a hack, but Flash Boys is a really I'm good Michael explanation. Lewis. He's not really a hack. <laughs> he went to the high school. It's right? really That's pretty shocking. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. How it all came down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, again, the question is, how is it tied to speed and the, this mastery that capital wants? We spoke earlier about desire. I mean, the desire is really to master speed. You know, the speed, the speed is to hide what's going on. The well, it, it could be, but it's also mastering the speed. I mean, they, they have a hidden aspect to it, but they're making money off of this. They're not, they're not, they're not really, I mean, they, they, they know that at 30.23 a price might be 31.40 by 3 o'clock because of news coming out or because of an external, you know, I mean, right. there are all kinds of, I, I don't want us to get into the, the just one correspondence or a couple of causes here. I think it's a multiple, you know, right. set of determinant causes like speed, that are always going into this. Yeah. For a moment, it takes you yeah. away from risk, the risk. If you move fast enough, you yeah, you're hedging. I mean, this is, the risk. Yeah, this, this term, 
which is you know now kind of part of everyday vocabulary, the hedging factor in all of this is, is always operative. You know, how do I hedge against the loss? So you know, wondering how do I manage the risk to maximum you know efficiency? Right. So if they have like an optimal speed, maybe as they're looking at hedging the risk. Have they figured out, maybe if we move this? Well, they're, they're, they're looking at, I mean, I'm sure they're looking at this uh, in, in some ways, but right. yeah. Yeah, but the, yeah. The, the amazing thing is that it still stays steady through the day. We only have one or two blowouts in the last year. You know, this is fascinating in a certain way that you have this kind of almost efficient market working, you know, in such a way with trillions of dollars every day exchanging, you know, back and forth through machines, through personal things, right? Through news, through all, all of these factors, multiple factors. But at the same time, in, in, in Tokyo is open. When Tokyo closes, London opens. When London closes, you know, New York opens, right? So you have this, this, this kind of, you know, seven and a half, you know, hour, you know, 9.30 to four in the U.S., you know, six and a half hour trading day, or seven and a half hour trading day, no, six and a half, six and a half hour trading day. And then it's 24 seven because you have aftermarket stuff too, where you can trade in, you know, what used to be called the archipelago. I think they have a different term for it now, but, but, but anyway, so, I mean, the amazing thing to me is that they're able to keep the equilibrium and the balance to a point, right, <laughs> where they can still control this, you know? I mean, you read the Wall Street, look, look, look at the headline in the Wall Street Journal. We're in great shape. Jobless rate at 17-year low. <laughs> what kind of jobs? <laughs> well, not only, you know, what, yeah, and, and, and how many people have gotten out? How was the rate put together? All of these things, little sign of slowing. The wage growth remains slow. Oh, yeah. So this is this is the, the beginning here of the propaganda that's going to say, oh damn, you know, we can argue, you know, look how beautifully we're doing here. But the market yeah, hates a low jobless rate. It does. It hates it. Yes. I mean, that was the latest. That that's was true. the last that's major true. crash. Was and then you look job. at the other side. Yeah. We're going to have higher price on oil. The Saudis, the OPEC wants eighty dollars a barrel. Now that, of course, is going to affect everything from our utility bills to, you know, how we travel during the summer. You're going to be reading reports. Oh, Memorial Day was down because of the price of gas, right? Because, and then you're going to blame it on the Saudis or on OPEC. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to, yeah, well, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, but yeah, I, yeah, it's, right. it's making me really angry. That's what it's supposed to be. Okay. Well, I, but, but I, I need know. coffee, man. <laughs> I need cold coffee. Yeah. I'm not at the level of sophistication sorry, that all of you seem to be with being able to Put that play one on the, the, the game of vocabulary and understanding. I'll have some too. And so I'm sitting here okay. wondering. I'll have some too. I'll some okay. 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 <laughs> I'm sitting here wondering what, you know, urban warfare is to me in this model is what I learned in Zero Hour, how the, uh, the Give Me film, Zero Hour, where you talk, it's essentially Israel and, and uh, the United States that went in and destroyed and murdered some of the Russians. And I'm trying to figure out what you say to a, a young radical who's not educated to the degree that you all are conversant with, with capital at this level about the human that needs to be which is left, increasingly left out of this model. The human element is increasingly left out. So I'm just sitting here Go thinking, ahead, am I just No, no, I'm stupid? listening to Jim. No, okay. Am I being stupid? Am I being emotional? Am I, you know, I'm trying to figure out why am I here? I, want, I came here because I wanted to. I got some food. I got some food here. The bread is good. The bread is good. You want to learn how to read? No, no. Because every time I look at these pages, I skip over them. And the Times and the Wall Street Journal, I thought, well, maybe even this old age, I can understand what these pages mean. What, 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 what do you mean by this? I, I want to I wanna yeah. offer a Go rejoinder. Ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, listening to what. Jim said, I just want to offer a rejoinder. Sure. And that is, I think that what brings your frustrated comment together with what Michael's talking about today is what was presented at CUNY Grad Center by this guy, Chocolas. 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 Chuk, chuk, chocolas. Just mangle that name. Um, it's like Constantinos. But the reason is 
that this was a talk about May 68 and could May 62 an insurgency, like you're talking about, could it happen again? What he ended up talking about was not the revolutionary spirit, the level of organization of the working class. What he ended up talking about was this, the disembeddedness of markets. Right. And the fact that in 68, you might be able to hold capital hostage for 24, 48 hours, mm. and the president leaves the country. Not anymore. And it's the short-termism that Michael's talking about. Right. Right. It's that he described it as, what was it, Michael? A snatch and grab, right. a, right. Um, a, a crash and burn, right. a, whatever it was that, that um, Kublik, I don't know, the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the raging tribes did. That slash, you just go in and you milk the economy dry and then you move along as soon as it becomes inhospitable. And he said, look at the example of Greece. If you want to know what's possible in the current financial environment, A, they had an insurgency in the street like hadn't been seen in 15 years. B, they freaking changed the government. How far to get them with the current level of markets and financial, what'd that get them? And, and very well-educated communists in that government. And I, think I mean, these were not stupid people or people who did not understand this. brings your question together with the yeah, need to understand yeah, this. Yeah. 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 Is this, this, this is a limiting there, factor. Right? Still. Because you're it. always talking about fighting capital. I, I understand that, and um, but I, I'm looking for some hope for how you make change. This oh, seems hope, to be, forget it. The new science of psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> psychedelics, Jim. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal. It's like when I go into a store today who says, I don't want cash. We only take credit cards. And I'm, am, I, am I understanding of that is that they don't trust their workers. Essentially, it's about they think they're going to be robbed. The owner of the store. That's what I how I think about it. And I know, you know, what I do is I put the, in the tip jar whatever the cash is, and every single time I get what I want. You know, it just but, I, but you know, I'm, I'm just venting a little bit. I'm glad I'm here. I'm going to come back. Especially if Rachel keeps talking. But it's 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 um it's overwhelming how dominant this is at the moment to me. And I, and I just hope that there's some way, some counterforce to this, or are we at this triumph of capital that's just going to go on? Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to you know, project that it's triumphalist. Negative I think I'm, I'm trying well, to just say, I'm really trying to say that in a way, unless we understand this and what we're up against, we don't really have a ghost of a chance. Right. I mean, this is yeah. part of the problem. We've been asleep at the wheel for a very long time here. Yeah. In my opinion, well over 40 years. You know? yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, and uh, part of the problem is, is that everybody thinks that, you know, spontaneous activism or activism, protest and resistance are the ways to go. I'm not, I don't have anything against that. I'm not yeah. saying don't go to the Brooklyn Bridge and occupy it or occupy Zuccotti Park. The issue is, unless you understand what you're up against, including, yeah. we're not even talking yeah. about then you make the wrong demand. repressive <laughs> state, yeah, state right. apparatus alongside right. this, because the police are also involved in this, and the state is involved in this. We're just talking, basically here, describing and trying to analyze the Wall Street program, but that is, you know, <laughs> coordinated very much yeah. with every other aspect of the state repressive apparatus. And the ideology they have won, would you speak to in a certain yeah. way, yes, they have been triumphal. If 52% of Princeton graduates want to go into investment banking, and this is what you're getting out of the elite, whereas Bob Dylan in Princeton is singing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the locust sang out in the distance when he picks up his degree, you know, back 50 years ago, very different Princeton, right? We're living in very different times. But the, the question to me is, yes, I mean, yes, how do you explain this to people? Well, students have student debt. That's a very good starting point. Yeah. I mean, you know, talk to them about what relationship student debt has to the general economy. 
and what, well, how they're situated in it. This is a very good thing, and if you can do that in an articulate, systematic way, I think you're, you're, you're really hitting the personal alongside of the political, you know, since this seems to be, a, you know, always a pressing question for you. How do you really reach the younger people? I mean, half of my lectures in, in philosophy classes are really about student debt and the effect it has on education and what's going on. Mm. You know, yeah. we read Plato through that lens. We read Aristotle through that lens. What is really going on here rhetorically, dialectically, you know, and in the, response in the system? Of your students? Well, they, they get angry. I mean, they, they, where do we go? That's what they ask. And then our question is one of, you know, of organization. What organizational, what institutional structures do we have? I mean, we're sort of finished in the academy, right? You know, in a certain way, I mean, the academy is maybe 10% left at, at a good day, you know? I and saw, saw a short film yeah. with the Workers Film Festival last night about the organizing of Uber and Lyft drivers, oh. um, which was, uh, it, gave me, it gave me hope for one thing. Uh, and then I found out that it's a federal law that independent contractors cannot organize. They cannot form a union. You know, I, I didn't know that. It's stupid me. But it's it, you know seeing how the the reaction of the anger of the drivers who bought the who bought the dream that was put forward about independent contracts right. in, and then had their rate lowered after yeah. they bought their car. Let me, it's, it's things yeah. like that. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, look at where look at where the the, 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 the activity the real hard hitting activity is happening now. It's in states where the teachers don't have the right to organize. Yes. So they're striking. They're just saying, "Okay, fuck right. you. We're out. We're out of here." <laughs> you know. And they're winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every fight back is good. Thank you for indulging me. I just didn't <laughs> say this. Beth does a much better job than I do. I'm glad she <laughs> took the lead on that. <laughs> <laughs> the mediation. You know, you don't need to read Hegel now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really right. happy right. with yeah. every fight back, but I just don't want it to end up as theater and that's the end of the story. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to change. Yeah. Well, the problem is it's no longer theater. That's part of the problem. You know, it's, it's reached this kind of virtuality. It's no longer, you know, where you have brunches like this and you, you know, discuss ideas. Everything is now the social media. Things get out of hand. You know, this is another thing that we're facing. You know, well-intentioned people who only use, right, the latest of the technology. It's you know, easier, it's easier to control and yeah. misinform and propaganda. Absolutely. Get yeah. The greatest tool the ruling class has had, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, the last 20 years. Because yeah. yeah. I, I, I can make an argument that that's happening within organizing within right. the black community presently. Absolutely. Right. Black Lives Matter is... Black Lives Matter. Well, Black Lives Matter yeah. had a problem because of how, well, this is what some people, right. the, the argument that some people have put forth, that Black Lives Matter um, started because of black male death, but then created an organization that was not centering or even discussing black male as part of the revolution. Because if you look at the mission statement, it says everybody else but black men, yet black men and people who are dying in the street. This is a point of contention that a lot of people within the, the movement have had with Black Lives Matter. Like, okay, yes, black women are dying too, but not at the same rate. Can we not include be inclusive? Why must we be exclusive? Right. Well, Why must we be argument too. I mean, it just Right, but all of that is meant to, you know, keep subordinate groups from aligning, right? So right. you have the paternalism right. on one end, and then you have the exclusion Absolutely. and vilification on the other end, right? right? So that's how that functions. In, in the Sandra Bland documentary, which is about to come out on HBO, I learned something I didn't know about her. She actually had had a, a, a video blog that she was putting up yeah, yeah. periodically, mm -hmm. in which she was talking like Malcolm at the end of this. She wasn't talking about race, dividing people along racial lines, right. but in other things, which I had no idea that she was doing that. And I think that that, that sort of a dialectic with Black Lives Matter rhetoric, I think, is a really important one for younger people to be exposed to. Do you follow me? 
Um, sort of. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. you should the, listen to the, you can find it on Google, <laughs> she's asked to say. You no, know, but what was her argument, really, because, right. in terms of Black Lives Matter, because Malcolm X and Black Lives Matter, in my mind, don't really They don't matter. Yeah. Well, right? well, no, so, I, I, I just agree. want to say, right? this I is agree. what's yeah. interesting, that's your position. Right. I'm saying, if you listen to how this young black woman who's not an academic learned from and then took her message to other young black people. Right. You know, uh, I'm saying I heard, I saw this dialectic going on with your thinking is not possible. And I'm no, no, it's possible, but I'm, I'm talking about the moments when it becomes impossible, when okay. there's this destructive propaganda within the world of social media to actually make the argument not about the, the problems, but about who gets attention. Yeah. Right, yeah. and I'm like, okay, so now we've argued about who gets attention, but we've not discussed the problem. Yeah. And I we mean, fought each other. To me, the real problem is we don't think. That's we don't yeah. think. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> without <laughs> without the reading, without studying up, right, which is a real problem for the young people today to really study up. To have that consistency, to have that ability. Well, to other things settled in subjectivity, Michael. It's well, not about intellectual discipline. Well, subjectivism, it's not really a subjectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, a different subjectivism thing. that's going on. So, this to me is a crucial issue going forward if you're to even have a semblance of any kind of oppositional culture that has any kind of meaning going forward. The rest is it's going to be the praxis old age home. Yeah, in a way, which is, you know, a good money-making venture for us. But, you know, <laughs> we can rehearse debates. So. Anybody want more coffee? Yeah, thank you, yeah, please. Some hot stuff. Yeah, yeah, good. Right. It's my dream. Are you, you having more coffee? I'll get that. I'm having more this if you have a cold. Okay. Okay. Michael, can I ask you yeah, something yeah, sure, different? Yeah, yeah. Materiality yeah, yeah. versus immateriality. Fang? Is it immaterial? Yeah, you could look at it. Or, or is it point. immaterial based on... Material. It's based on materiality. I mean, the problem with the separation. The kind of, yeah, go ahead. I mean, like, like you've got a so-called immaterial currency. Right. Digital right. currencies, but they're based on more electricity usage than right. you right. know half the city of New York City. So right. what's the immaterial material difference there? The immateriality in terms, in terms always referred to refers basically to the. Um, to the um, um, the lack of concrete, you know, tangible value. It's not really based on resource, right? Or on, um, um, you know, it doesn't really have a material basis, right? It's virtual, right? In, in some ways. So you're dealing with sparks, electricity, things like that would be, quote, immaterial to, you know, this, this divide between materiality and immateriality, right? So the materiality would be the oil or the fossil fuel that generates the electricity, right? Which is part of the immateriality of the moment, right? That cannot be quote unquote measured in labor time or in extractive time. Yeah, yeah. Right? So this, this is part of the divide there. I don't think it's a necessary distinction because ultimately all of this thing economy, which is Facebook, Alphabet, I mean, excuse me, Apple, Amazon, um, Netflix, and Google, is still dependent upon, again, anticipated fictitious capital, anticipated expectations for earnings, right? For, for out of profit. But even beyond that, how right. immaterial are giant warehouses covered right. across the country? That's not very immaterial. No, that's materiality. Yeah. But the virtual space, right, in, in a certain way of which people are experiencing immateriality, right? They're experiencing only the electronic signals, the signaling, the actual encounter is only through the digital, right? It's not through the actual going to the place. But it's predicated except. on the material. It is predicated, always predicated on the materiality. There's nothing predicated on immateriality in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's I think it's a, a divide that came up 25, 30 years ago when technology began to assert its its kind of dominance, and you know this was a way of trying to explain it in terms of, of labor. Now, when you go to levels of abstraction, then you have problems because then you can say the teacher works much more now 
immaterially because they're always available on email, right? Or they're always available here. The worker like Rachel, you know, in the fashion industry is more available because they can email and text her at any time. So this becomes a new level, right? Vis-a-vis -vis labor and the extraction of surplus value that you cannot, quote unquote, you know, um, look at just simply through the materiality of the product or the commodity, right, in some ways. So this has some relationship to labor time, right, versus that of socially necessary labor right. time. Yeah. So there are many, many levels to all of this. The market, in a way, is completely, what we're discussing here are such high levels of abstraction, right? I mean, when I do index, you know, the, all this kind of language of Wall Street, th this is really, you know, immaterial, right? In the sense that it doesn't have a basis except in future materiality. For the time being, it is immateriality, right? Because it's based on future projections, etc. So Amazon is projected to keep growing, right? General Motors is projected to keep growing in China, not especially in the United States with plants, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is all part of the fictitious capital, which could be considered, you know, part of that immateriality. Yeah. But again, it materializes in, quote, prices of stocks, you know, that can become converted into liquid mean methods of payment, right? <laughs> can be converted into loan capital, bank capital, commercial capital, all these kind of things are happening too. So it's very, I mean, you know, you have all these kind of, they're, they're, they're basically all these kind of cross notions here. You know, who would have thought that this becomes a major advertiser? Facebook. But that's what it is. Where does its revenue come from? Data. Not, yeah, exactly. But that's not advertising, that's data collection. Collection, right. To sell to right, advertisers. Right, to sell to advertisers. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. The same with Amazon, does the same thing. Can pick up, to go back to Sean's word, the pattern, the gestalts of, of all these things. So they know that I'm going to buy, you know, 20 books on fictitious capital. If I order <laughs> one, right? They already know this, right? In a sense, right? That's true. So yeah. on my screen, it's going to come up. It's already programmed <laughs> into, the, into, the, into the pattern, right? Et cetera. Just, yeah, yeah. So you're seeing this in everyday life. So this whole, this notion of this guy that wrote the book, Capitalist Motor Prediction, right? The predictive behavior is working both on the immaterial level, right? In terms of the data, as you say, but also in terms of the future materialization of that. So, yeah. See, in Marxist time, he doesn't have data. He's not, he's not dealing with, you know, mm. this, this stuff, you know, back in the day. However, you know, if he was here today, he would probably begin with, you know, homo datum, right? This would be, and this is what Stiegler, you know, as a, the universal proletization of all of us, right? We don't know how to make anymore. That's immaterial, right? We know how to serve. <laughs> we may know how to interpret at some levels, but we don't know how to make. We don't look at things and how they're made. You know, we don't really know how to make things anymore. So in that sense, Stiegler says we don't know how to live. You know, one of the reasons for maybe so many pathologies. You know, this is another thing too. You know, or what becomes normative in this in this universe is, is it to be crazy as normative, which seems to be more and more the case. And it's true. Yeah, it's true. Insights, more and more the case. Insights, yeah. insights, yeah. insights, insights, insights. 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 Insight. Oh, you mean you like that, that, that involuntary oh, cell? I'm going to use that all week. I, look it up. <laughs> all week. I, mean, I, I got my code for the week. week. Yeah, I already know how to do this, right? I know how to shut up people. I'm an involuntary cell. <laughs> 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 yeah. So anyway, I don't know if that, I mean, you know, we can go back, we can revisit this, because this is a debate, especially among the Italian Marxists, uh -huh. Ver Versaloni, you know, some of the people around uh, the Negre school, Mario Tronti. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do, well, we're going to do that next year, yeah, I'm going to do the Tronti, um, you know, Coletti, uh, Della Volpe, Negre, you know, the, the, from Gramsci forward, you know, in terms of one major tendency. You know, to me, during this period, the 70s, it was the Italian Marxists who were thinking. <laughs> it wasn't so much the French, even though a lot of them were attending to Lewis's and uh, uh, lectures, and many of them were friends with Guattari, and the Althusserian school kind of continued. 
and you know, Sard was, you know, I mean, basically dying, you know, and that previous generation was kind of gone. But but you know, the Italian Marxists to me really did incredibly good work during the 70s, and that may have been a high point in terms of analysis, you know, in, in, in many ways, um, you know, from from that perspective, and that's the kind of media group. Why work? What is work? How does one overcome labor metaphysics? You know, what is the distinction between labor and leisure? You know, these are these are real questions that they're asking during that time, and still the question of making. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then along comes you know this digital revolution, and you have people like Stieglair, you know, and others who who begin to problematize this in a different way. You know, the technology now being dominant, right, in our everyday life and this proliferation of products. You know, another thing you can ask about speed, look at the speed of the products. You know, we're only 25, 1992 is the information highway. The internet begins 19, another crucial date. <laughs> we're only 25 years into this. Just think how many changes we've gone through from Cape Row to the early days of our emails, right? Now to everything contained in our phone, Google glasses, and having you know we we, we don't know what else, right? In a sense, but it so all that, started that with the defense industry, and it's all about well, of surveillance. Course. DARPA, yeah, yeah DARPA, yeah. DARPA, yeah, of course. Hmm? You can call me the White Sparrow. You know, you know, the, the White, white sparrow. sparrow. That's I like right. the exactly. White Sparrow. I've, I'm reading 24-7 right now. It's good, huh? That it's beginning, fantastic. Uh, the White Sparrow. Yeah. Very good book by uh, Jonathan Prairie, who's an art historian at Columbia called 24-7. You know, about the ideology of consistent no sleep. <laughs> Needing to eliminate we read sleep it. in late capitalism. You read it. Oh, oh, we read, read it. it. We read it as read a group. It. Yeah, a group. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <right. laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I think you were there. I don't know. No, I don't think we read it as a group. Not no? as a group. I no, referred to it and brought it in many times. You referred to it. Yeah, yeah. It. No, we didn't read it as a group. Yeah, yeah. It's a quick, yeah, it's it's a quick it's read. It's a quick read. It's yeah. a bad It's short, read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. good, though. Really good. Yeah, it's a good book. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it begins with the investigation of DARPA's, you know, investment of a billion dollars in a bird called the White Sparrow that can go seven days without sleep. Doesn't need to and sleep. they're trying to understand this, of course, and we all know this is about cyber soldier, cyber, you know, <laughs> yeah. How do we do this, you know, in, in the future? How are we gonna build better soldiers than the uh, Israeli uh, Defense League? Did Jim leave? Yeah, yeah. Jim oh, left. Yeah, he just left him. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, he okay. drew down and ran out the door. He did? Yeah. Okay. He did revolution. <laughs> you gotta go lead it, yeah. I'm not yeah. on the front line, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but um, but um, yeah. So um, yeah, we'll do this Italian school too. I mean, later on. But you can see, you know, some of the like Mogliani. He was a major player, Franco Mogliani, on this asset pricing model. You know, how do you basically sit down and look at a company and break down its assets and its liabilities, and how do you price that? into terms of sale of it, and how do you price that in terms of market capitalization. You know, this is a very significant moment in, uh, in, in corporate, uh, you know, uh, theory, you know, and theory of how, you know, the, uh, the markets will uh, operate and how does one, you know, give value to these companies. This is very, very significant. So um, let, me, let me do a couple of other things and then, uh, yeah. I hope Jim wasn't offended by anything we did. No, no, no. no. I think he had okay. places to go and people to see. Okay, good. No, that's good. Okay. No, it was so, not. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, we need, um, we need more Jims. Yeah. We need more Jims. <laughs> so, this is, my, this is kind of the general uh, tendon thing I want to do here. First of all, you know, today is a kind of an introduction to the philosophy. I want to do this in three parts the philosophy of finance, right? That would be the philosophy of money and finance, and how do we talk about this. The second would be more the philosophy of money, right? The function of money as a means of exchange, right? As a unit of account, store of value, and a standard of deferred payment. You know, the four functions of money, but then to look at it beyond that, right? And we're going to look at it beyond that in terms of the being of money. Is it as a medium, a measure, a standard, and as a store? Right? As a what? A store. store. Like a store. Oh, store, of a value. store of value. Yes, right? Yeah. Okay? Medium so measure. I'll put in a, a medium, yeah, a measure. Right. A store. 
and a um, um, what was the, uh, the uh, standard, standard, right? Standard, standard of, de of deferred payment, really. Yeah. Okay. So medium measure, standard, and store. So the four functions, if you will, of money, according to Wall Street. You know, this is bourgeois economics, right? Not Marx, right? We're going to look at Marx in a different way. So this is how money functions, right? How is money in our economy, right? Okay. So, um, so we would do that, and then the third part would be the age of the derivative. So we would go from philosophy of finance, which is part of what we're doing today, of finance and financialization, right? Right, the philosophy of finance, so that'd be number one. Number two would be the philosophy of money, with the four functions, right, as well as more, right? And asking the question. And the third would be the age of the derivative, right? In of the derivatives. And it's social logic and the post-credit money. Okay, so we're going to look at this in terms of the social logic of the derivative. We'll try to look at this more accurately and concretely. And what I'm going to call the post-credit economy. Right. The edge of the derivative in the post-credit economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, then the idea of how is money, we would do the analysis. There, there are several historical moments here. Let me see if this works. Yeah, it'll probably work. Um, The disembeddedness that Beth referred to, by, by the way, is a term used by Carl uh, Pogliani uh, uh, from a book called uh, The Great Transformation on the Disembeddedness of, of Markets. And if you want, I'm, I'll make a PDF, I've got to send it to Beth, of the Chugolas essay on the deregulation of morals in which he puts this out there, Disembeddedness of Markets, it's uh, called uh, Pogliani. Yeah. So anyway, um, but Peter's essay in the more recent situations is really good on that too. <coughs> um, the one on the Greek the Universal is yeah. crisis. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll, I'll send both. What month do you remember? Um, I can send it to you. I'll send it. It's the last situation. The last one, six yeah. number ones and, and two. Yeah. So you have um, the commodity theory of money. And I'm giving you kind of background theories here theory of money. So this is all under the second part uh, of money. Um, and this is fundamentally the commodity theory of money is out of Adam Smith and Marx. Out of both. And although I would argue that Marx goes way beyond, you know, obviously Smith, Adam Smith, um, in terms of, you know, looking at money beyond just the commodity theory. So let's say he's on the line, so to speak, right? Okay, and then there's the fiat theory of money. And this is Keynes, right? And now, but mostly Keynes. I just put Keynes up, John Maynard Keynes, of course, you know, the great English <laughs> savior to market economy, <laughs> during, you know, the, the post depression yeah. yeah. Anyway, and then there's the credit theory of money. So you have three basic theories, the credit, the fiat, I mean the fiat and then the credit theory of money. Which is where, in some ways, the age of the derivative comes out of, right? You know, you remember, we really don't talk anymore about fiscal responsibility. We don't really talk about fiscal policies anymore. You know, we don't talk about the building of cities anymore. Mm -hmm. We talk about gentrification. We talk about these kind of things. We no longer talk about social programs, putting money into things. So this is interesting, this shift from the Keynesian, you know, moment of the fiat theory of money and how it can be used in terms of social, you know, equilibrium, if you will, or some kind of logic of, you know, making the society better, which Keynes was certainly interested in. He had a moralist position in some ways, even though he was English and you know, <laughs> you know, he played the market from his bed every day. He wasn't that successful. He did okay, but nothing nothing special. But it goes to show you that economics is not really necessary to, you know, do well in the 
in the stock exchange, you know, it would be a, a speculator or a speculative uh, trader. Mm -hmm. So, what anyway. Is, where is this credit theory of money coming out to? Who were the thinkers of this, I guess? Well, um, you know, we're going to get into that. I mean, it's going to probably be um, the post-credit money and all of this is after Bretton Woods. Okay. So it'll be Robert Schiller. It'll be the Chicago School. Um, you know, we'll look at Becker, Greg Gary Becker, I'll mention some of these names. There's the guy who wrote Human Capital, you know, etc. And uh, the best um, um, of the ethnography, ethnography, ethnographies, excuse me, of, of this is uh, a woman named Karen Ho, H-O, uh, uh, Duke University Press. I think it's called the Ethnography of Wall Street. So she, she's one who does some of the Wall Street bestiary, you know, how these people operate. And an uh, interesting story to me is we, uh, we went, uh, Peter Stanley and I went to England and we did a kind of homage to Stanley's work and, uh, at uh, the University of um, uh, London, uh, Queen Mary. And uh, it was sponsored by the called Critical Business School and Critical Studies. So part of the thing is we gave presentations and all this and homages, but anyway, the, then they asked us to do master classes with some of the students, and these students are critical business school students, right? Critical theory and business school. So a lot of them are doing ethnography on what they call the traders, you know, the guys that trade every day on the exchange and how crazy they all are. So I got a <laughs> dose of this, this kind of way that business schools are doing critical theory to look at these uh, these uh, these characters. All right. So yeah, the post credit is basically um, um, you know um, the um, of course the um, uh, the financial derivatives trading is going to go into this this thing the credit theory and the post credit economy right the age of the derivative right because we're going to look at that and uh, remember um, that stocks bonds commodity and currency trading are all part of a quote natural habitat for this this culture for money right you have to think of money in what is its environment right and its environment is really stocks bonds currencies and commodities at this point of course real estate deals but for our purposes since we're only dealing we're dealing with money as an abstraction you know we have to think of this in terms of you know natural habitats for you know contemporary money so um, another thing we're going to do, um, you know, just going forward in the how is money and how it operates in the exchange, is look at forms of analysis by Wall Street. The fundamental analysis, how one fundamentally analyzes markets and price and patterns, right, and earnings reports, et cetera, et cetera, versus that of technical analysis, going back to what Beth was talking about, the nanoseconds of um, you know trading and all of that is usually based on technical charts, you know, either bar graphs or what are called candlesticks or Bollinger bands. We'll go into some of that vocabulary too. How does one read charts, and what's the difference between a technical analysis and a fundamental analysis? So the technicians, in my opinion, never get really rich, but they do pretty well <laughs> in the short term, whereas the fundamentalists usually have a better thing. Although that may be changing with this new, you know, these new algorithmic trading systems. How do you read the, you know, the, the charts in, in a certain, uh, you know, in these kind of patterns? And you can see this, you know, the people, I don't know if you've ever seen the machines, but, you know, you can see it's like watching a, um, you know, a heart, uh, you know, a, a cardiogram or, or watching your vitals, right? You know, like this, right? So in a way. So when people used to say the ticker tape or the watching the, the, the tape was like reading the pulse of the nation, you're basically reading the pulse, yes, of the, quote, secondary, but really in some ways it's become the primary economy. We're no longer a land of production. We're a land of money. Right? This is the new habitat, right? In terms of financial capital, that's that's the interesting thing about all of this. It's no longer about what do you produce, but what what <laughs> what kind of money do you own? What kind of money do you own? What kind of money do you owe? Right? Etc. And it goes back to the great maxim of that capitalism is made us so stupid. We're getting stupider each year because what capitalism is really based on is the logic of the O and the ought. 
what we owe, right, and what we ought to do. This is its logic always in terms of reform. I'll stick to that proposition. Yeah. You know, capitalism has made us so stupid because we only think in categories of owing and ought. Owing and obligation. Right? This is what we don't think beyond this. This is why a Heidegger or a Wittgenstein or these people are so important. They at least change the terrain in terms of that kind of thinking. And that's very Kantian, too, by the way. Kant is a thinker of capitalism. Kant is a thinker of Newtonian physics, you know, I mean, to make this a little more philosophical, I'll go, I'll go there later. But, you know, but yes, I mean, capitalism is based on Newtonian time. It's not, but now it's trying to move to Einsteinian time. Very interesting, this whole thing with speed, light, and drag. But up until when I was writing this stuff about the theories from the 50s until, the, you know, 1973, this is still based on Newtonian time. Mm -hmm. You know, they're thinking of this in terms of Newtonian time. Now capital has gone way beyond that. Yeah, yeah. And Elon Musk's, uh, you know, quest for space. Huh? <laughs> you know, that's where he's different, right? <laughs> Building the ship. Right? Bezos too. Bezos, yeah, Bezos too. too. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy from Virgin. I'm sure. yep. Oracle, Larry Ellison. Yep. He was the first. Obama's best Ellison. friend. Who, who's the who's, who's Oh, because you guys go to his Eric Schmidt? Yeah. Uh, Schmidt? No, the no. guy from Google. I'm not Google. Yeah, that's Virgin. 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 Virgin Airlines. Oh, Branson? Yeah. Branson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, that's that's sort of what we're going to do. I mean, that's what we're going to do. Um, I want, um, uh, let me just uh, say a couple of things. Um, about the marks. The marks uh, we should read for next week. I don't know if you have volume three. I can bring handouts, but if you have volume three, chapter 25, which is, um, you know, uh, entitled Fictitious Cap Credit and Fictitious Capital. This is the section in which he deals. Is there a version you want a version copy the book? That yeah, you which one do you have? Well, yeah. this is this is the penguin. The folks, this, this translation yeah, is by far the best. Which well, no, man. No, this is the Fernback uh, translation, but Mandel okay, writes the introduction. Yeah, the Mandel introduction is very good. By the way, the the the, the necessity of Volume Three, which Harvey and other people don't really go to, and even my you know friend uh, Rick Wolf, they're not thinking through. They don't volume go through three. three. What's that? Really? You know why? Mm. Because they think God capitalism is about ready to collapse. On its own accord. <laughs> and I've been hearing this for many years. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting, like Al Sharpton with trickle down economics. I'm still waiting for it to rain. In this case, I'm still waiting to see the building fall. But it ain't happening, you know? Yeah. This is very, I mean, one thing we hopefully will learn how difficult this is and why, when yeah. Marx was asked by his son in law, Paul Lafarge, the author of The Right to Be Lazy, what is the meaning? of life and the old man replied one word struggle and yes. you know that's a good lesson struggle and when Thelonious Monk was asked what is the meaning of life he said death so you don't need much <laughs> more than Monk and Marx you know to <laughs> pick up on you know beginning value of, uh, of life and meaning in some ways but anyway yeah no I mean you know listen I mean, I, I, I'm all for, you know, anyway, we, we, I really wish we had the organizational structures. We don't. You know, we're going to see, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I don't think I'm saying anything profound or visionary here, but during the next year, two years, you know, all the way up to the presidential election of 2020, we're going to see the Democratic Party co-op more and more of all these little movements that are happening. Yes, we know it's awful. It was all Trump's fault. You know, we know we're going to do something about it. We're going to take care. Black Lives Matter, please, you have a big seat at the table. Student debt, you have another big seat at the table, right? Right. All the identity politics, please, you know, we know you haven't gotten enough for your share of the buy. You know, so, I mean, this to me is what's coming down. Because we don't have, you know, quote, the organizational structures for thinking, you know, and practice. We don't, we don't have it. We have the commons, we have May Day, we have this People's Forum that we'll probably do some courses in in, uh, in uh, September on 37th Street, but we don't have, you know. And then you have a poor people's movement coming up with w William Bar Bar Barber, the, the priest, right, from the Carolinas, and, you know, in a way. But well, who's going to co-op that? 
You already see it. Well, well, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. According to Bruce Dixon of Black Agenda Report, it's done been co-opted. Yeah. Yes, yes. Millions of, of dollars of, of yeah. salary is going on there. Right. And um, How come this you is read all those radical sites. They must be looking <laughs> at you. Black <laughs> like Agenda Report. It's the best one. And Bruce Dixon. I like Greg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. it's a great, great, great design. He yeah. is so uncomfortable. It's called the Black Agenda <laughs> Report. Yeah. Yeah. Glenn, yeah. Ford. Glenn Ford. Glenn Ford is great. He's a good Leninist with an imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and a sharp tongue. Yeah, yeah a very sharp yeah. tongue. Good style. Yeah, and you got Raymond, our friend Raymond. Yeah, yeah. Raymond Black yeah. Turner. The poet in residence. The poet in yeah. residence. Yeah. Yeah. Raymond, yeah. right? Still wants the shirt. I'm gonna go and I'll put it in my will. <laughs> Raymond Black Turner. <laughs> right, the shirt off my back. You know? <laughs> right. Anyway, but um, um, yeah, but I mean, think about this too. I mean, when we start talking about activism and all of that, and this collapse of capitalism, and it can't get any worse. Of course, it can get worse. <laughs> you know? Yeah, more and more every day. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like it's Bernie out. Sanders never stood up and said anything about social security. The how how limited it is in terms of the treatment of the elderly, how you get doubly taxed on Social Security. Yeah. The yeah. same thing with Medicare. Nobody even broaches these topics, and these are considered your, quote, left people in the Democratic Party. Not even broach. Yeah. yeah. In a sense. And you got, yeah. Uh, yeah. you got, um, what's her face uh, from Massachusetts? Uh, Warren. 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 Yeah, Warren. 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 You can imagine what Trump's going to do. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, she's He'd out. Slaughter her. She's out <laughs> campaigning for this guy who's running against Dennis Kucinich. Um, yeah, she's campaigning for this guy who wants fracking, huh. is for the death penalty. Wow. Who is? I saw her. I saw her speak years ago before Hillary was running, and she was with Paul Krugman on stage and. She just made her, she looked like a fool, you know? She, you could tell she, all she was doing was pandering. Yeah. And yeah. she had gotten, she got some celebrity status and she felt a certain way about it. Yeah. And every time Paul Kirkman dis disagreed with her, she reversed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, no, she's, trying to, she's trying to navigate her way to the, uh, he to, just, the to the presidential candidacy. He you know, sat on stage deal. like frustrated because He's like, well, I think I'm the only person who's got something to say on the stage, and she won't let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Is this Krugman? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 No. It was pretty bad. It was. Yeah. It was awful. But everybody liked her because you know, she's Pocahontas. So anyway, <laughs> why don't we do for for next week uh, since it's um you know about three thirty and. Uh, yeah. Um, why don't we do uh, the fictitious capital, cool. right, and the, the banking components, right? And I'll, I'll prepare something on that. And then I'll, if you can get a hold of um, uh, uh, finance capital, those pages I put up earlier, try to read as much as you can of that as, to, and, as well on fictitious capital. And we're going to meet in two weeks. Is that right? Is that the, the deal? You want to meet on the 20th? Um, why don't you tell me? Yeah, us. yeah. So you're talking about Mark's Volume 3, chapters 25 and 30? Yes, 20, okay, 25 yeah. and 30. I'll send out an email, 25 okay. and 30, that we have a text to work with. Mm -hmm. Secondly, then we would have, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, before we leave, I'll just go through this real quickly, the Wall Street Journal. But if you can next week, or the, you know, even just bring this one. I mean, I don't know. I know $5 is kind of ridiculous. But where can we, where can we get it? You can get it online. I mean, the thing is, do we want the journal or do we want financial? You right. I think, I think one each, one, yeah. one rotation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, transaction? Financial like Hudson Times Hudson is, uh, yeah. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It was like so yeah. weird. I'm like, they used to be everywhere. We can do next week and the week after. The 13th um, and, so and the 20th? And the 20th. So okay. The weekend of Memorial 27th Day weekend, I'm going to okay. be working all weekend. Okay, so. no problem. Okay, so let's plan on next weekend. If there's any change, I'll let you know. I'll try okay. to, you know, kind of issue and, uh, you know, whether I'll be here or not. But I'll see. You know, yeah, probably will be. Yeah. Right. I'm going in for it. Oh, of course, yeah. And what I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, I, I promise not to harass you, but just in case something comes up a last minute or in the day out, if you can put your phone numbers, your names yeah, and yeah. phone numbers here would be great, right? Right? In some ways. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh.
So we have. You need a change. I only have. A, I don't have any change. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you just go? Yeah. Okay. Next yeah. week. Yeah. 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 Be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Let me just do this real quickly. I mean, obviously, the Wall Street Journal is. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, the uh, Wall Street Journal is um, is um, a newspaper oriented towards Wall Street, obviously. And um, the um, the thing is, is that yes, they'll always repeat, you know, the dominant uh, economic data of the of the week on the front page, right? Uh, and then, of course, it'll be about natural resources and price of commodities. This usually is going on on the first page. And then you have a synopsis here on the side. So you can see this is oriented to a very quick reader, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's not really anything that demands much of the mind, right? It's basically an informational, you know, paper in a sense. And then you look at it and most of the, most of the uh, you know, articles are really about, you know, um, um, you know, the, the Fed, you know, what effect the Fed is going to have, you know, then they have some, some work on China and Korea, right, et cetera. So it's just very synoptic in terms of the, of the, of the, thing, uh, uh, of the, um, of the week's news. Uh, the German bishops, you can see here. I mean, you know, this is pretty funny in some ways if you really start thinking about what kind of stories they, they, they choose, right? <laughs> the politics revise the Protestants at a cost, right? The jihadists, the making and the unmaking of the jihadists. And then they have a little thing on the sports page. And then this, this is the ideology, and it's mostly, basically, the opinion page, right? <laughs> Which is, you know, sometimes more intelligent than the New York Times in terms of value. Right, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And so, anyway, um, 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 so this is the front part. But the, the part that's, that's interesting in terms of learning how to read, you know, the financial tables is the Markets Digest. And this gives a kind of weekly, weekly thing of the major indexes. And, and I'll go over this next week, too. I mean, I don't want to keep you forever here. Um, you know, you'll get the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Transportation Average, and the Utilities. This was all part of the Dow theory. You know, the 30 industrial stocks, the, you know, the 15 transportation, and the utilities. This was the beginning of the American capitalist system. Transportation, utilities, and industrials, right? This was the major stock. This does not really take into account, they don't have a FANG index, although some people are keeping FANG, I keep a FANG in FANG index, but I think it's important because it gives you a sense of the technology going forward. So anyway, then you get the Barron's 400, 400 companies that Barron's considers big. What, what this is measuring is, you know, basically the price movements up or down on the week. They give you the 52 week high and low. And then if you look over, you look at advancing the volume. So 763 million shares went up, right? Whereas on, on the declining, I mean, excuse me, totally traded, the advancing volume was 6 million, 623 million, whereas the declining was only 130. So this was a very strong market week in terms of buying, right? You begin to read between the lines. How many issues were traded? How many advanced? 2,300 versus 700 going down. So you had, just by throwing darts, they used to call a random dart theory, you know, you throw darts, you had a three in one chance, you know, <laughs> better than three, you know, one out of, uh, you know, three out of four chances of hitting a winner during the week, right? Something like that. And that's part of it. Now they have the tracking of industries here. You can see the charts now. It's very infantile, but in another <laughs> level, it gives you a sense of what's, what's going on. All on one page. There's a lot happening here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in some ways, right, when you extract. Then the international stock indexes, the world, the Americas, the European markets, and the Asia Pacific. Right? And it goes through this too. And remember, this is very much globally interconnected because the hedge fund people will buy in Tokyo and they may sell in London the same stock. Mm -hmm. Or they may be moving a lot of money to the Nikkei in Japan 
and you know, getting rid of stock in Germany on the DAX mm -hmm. or the Concarret to the CAC 40 in, in Paris or London, etc. So this becomes very international. Then you see there's a thing here called the percentage gainers. This is what went up the most during the week. So Boston Pharmaceuticals, which I did not know, was up 81%, um, 81% uh, in a week. Wow. So every yeah. dollar you put up, you got 81 cents back. Not bad return on money, given the fact that CD rates are 2% right now, right? In one week, that's one year, 2%. So if you had the right things, then the commercial vehicle group, Mexico Energy, Carbon Black, and Portfolio Pharmaceutical, which is probably online pharmaceuticals, right? Then you have the, you know, the other ones, and then you have the losers. So they give you an indication of what's going up and down. I know people that basically trade off of this. They take the ones that go down the most, and then they buy them the next week, thinking they'll get what's called the, the olive, the cat bounce, right? <laughs> Right, and the cat bounce back up, and they can make a little bit of money that way. Do they? So yes. some, some do. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll get to that. I mean, I don't know, you know. Yeah, I mean, I would love that if I could, uh, you know, to my I have psychological blocks against, uh, you know, this uh, in some ways trading too much. Right. Anyway, but I'm I'm trying to overcome those. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have high maintenance people in my life. You, know, <laughs> you have to think of something anyway. So currencies, uh, then they give you the currencies down here. The task, in a way, is to interrelate. You know, be able to see the interrelations between this. You know, if the Canadian dollar is down significantly and the price of lumber, et cetera, how does that translate into buying Georgia Pacific or Warehouser? You know, this right. is the kind of stuff you want to start to begin to correlate. This is the way, I'm, you know, I'm putting us in the mind of the speculator here in a certain way. How, how does this work? Okay, so then you have the Forex, uh, the rates. The Forex is based the forex on the dollar. Forex is the currency, isn't it? Yes, that's yeah. the currency. That's down here as well, the Forex, right, right? And you can get this stuff online, by the way. You can see the Forex online. You know, I go to the Forex because I have... You know, I go to Montreal a lot. I track both the euro and the Canadian dollar actively. You know, and uh, try to try to think of this, uh, you know, happening. So then, anyway, then you get another another page here. Well, well, we can go over this more in detail, but just to give you a sense, market data continues. So this is data at work and interpreting the data. Then you get the futures contract, and what it shows at the top here, the greatest performer during the week was wheat. Up seven percent the cost of wheat. Now, whether you see that in the price of bread in Italy is another story, right? Does that correlate immediately? Not, not especially. Yet. Not, yet. not not yet. Right? Wheat is here. See on this page the winners, right? Wheat and corn were tremendously, and then they have indexes. So it's giving you what they that what they the neoliberal economy is doing now, or the neo neoliberal take has now started to show. You know, not only just stocks, but commodities and currencies and their movement and international indexes. So this is a new kind of chart that has been put out because of globalization, right? It is kind of keeping up with the times, you know, and, and in terms of the way they do that. So anyway, then you get the agricultural, the futures contracts, which is another derivative market, right? That basically you can bet on the bet. <laughs> to hedge whether corn is going to be higher in six months or not, or wheat, or for that matter, gold, you know, for that matter, currencies. You can bet on whether the euro in six months is going to be higher in relation to the U.S. dollar or lower, right? All of these contracts, you know, exist at this point, all right? So then you go through the, the yields of the bonds because, you know, again, to the professional that's doing this or to the speculator that does this for a living, they want to know, is money going to go guaranteed at 3% if the yield curve goes there? I'm not so bad at 3% because it's safe and guaranteed versus that of speculating to make 10, 15%. Is it worth the risk reward <laughs> ratio? So, so these tables are very important to be correlated to look at maybe the possibility of flows of, of money, right? Then the corporate debt, you know, they have companies. How much can you, you know, get the corporate debt gives you ratings, 
as a rating system, AAA being the highest, all the way down to BBB and BBC, which are basically junk and C is real junk. <laughs> you know, the old junk bond uh, culture, in a sense. The highest yields, the dividends, and then they have exchange-traded portfolios, how they put together multiple baskets of stocks on exchanges, and this is another thing called ETF, right? So a lot of the, a lot of the um, um, uh, 401ks work with these, three, these, these ETFs now, too. Then the dividend changes, whether something went up in dividend, which is an indication usually that a company is giving back something to a shareholder. Mm -hmm. And again, I forgot to mention the language. It's not shareholder culture, it's stakeholder <laughs> now. The stakeholder right, culture, right, in a sense. And then they begin with the mutual money rates where you borrow, right? The amount of borrowing rate. So on one page, you're, you're getting, you know, the cost of money, right? Dividends, right? Exchange trading portfolios commodity prices, the futures market, and all this, all in the data. Then you go over the biggest hundred stocks, you know, listed, how much volume they traded, what was the high low in the week, when are their dividend day. One thing you can do on markets, it's very interesting, you can capture dividends. You buy before the X dividend, so you get, for 13 months, you get you know, 15 months of dividends, right? The quarterly dividend. My so you get the you extra period of time. Mutual yeah. funds was the cost of borrowing. How no, 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 no. It's just another category. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 okay. no. No, the mutual funds mean you have mutual, all of us yeah, put yeah. money into one growth fund together. What right? Is a mutual fund. Mean, huh? mean in terms of Admiral, <laughs> that? I'm sorry? Admiral. Admiral is the name of the company, the name of the, the mutual fund itself. Hero Price, Oppenheimer, you know, used to be Dreyfus, you know, all of these, Vanguard, these are all mutual funds. So Admiral just means fund? No, 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 Admiral means the name of it's the a particular fund. Name. The particular name of the fund. But they, yeah. they list it over and over again. Yes, but they have different, see, they yeah, have different they categories. Have they have Sean Aparicio's Income Fund, <laughs> Your Growth Fund, Josh's yeah. Hedge Fund. You know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Phil's commodity it's fund. They have that, they have multiple <laughs> multiple funds depending on your needs but it just and your makes desire. It's like a placeholder name. It's just an empty name. Well, it's the name of the corporate. It's the name of the fund. It's right? a market. Yeah, it's a brand. Yeah, it's a brand. Yeah. Just a brand. Yeah. Let me if, see where it is. If you have a smartphone, you'll you have all of this anyway. Also oh, a, Vanguard oh, Admiral well, that's is one of their funds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's a Vanguard fund. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's a Vanguard fund, one of many of the hundreds of Vanguard <laughs> funds. Of course, we took off. Useless. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean they're all called that? ADM Ellison? Yeah, but they're all different kinds of allocations. You see, right, you have right. bank. But I'm talking you about have, the word itself, if they just keep yeah. repeating it for everything. No, they don't. Re they, they they repeat it as part of the Admiral Group, which is probably managed by about seven to eight portfolio managers in an office, and then they have twenty different Admiral sub -groups, funds, subgroups, right. right? Okay. So yeah, 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 yeah. There's one chief dominatrix, right? And then there are eight <laughs> subs, right? That are you know taking the flag. I'm sorry. I, I think, yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So anyway, that that that's that page, and then it continues with the mutual funds, and then you have a section called new highs and lows. New highs and lows are stocks that hit new highs for the year and then hit new lows. Okay. Then you see in this section on markets, you begin to see you know commentary. Right? On currencies, commentaries on the market. So you get a narrative. And then you have this kind of interesting charts. You don't get this, you know, the left should do stuff like this. Yeah. This is interesting. You have the, uh, the, what is happening, what American Express, what Cisco, Procter & Gamble, all these little narratives about where they are, you know, in the, in the general market, you know, situation. So the, in a way, you know, it may be infantile, but it's informative mm -hmm. to the people that are reading it and clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the point home, everybody's into the pool, right, the job. So we, we went, went from on page one, job market up, to the final page of the market section, B12, jobs figure drives the point home, right? <laughs> so you go from here, 
the jobless rate at a low all the way to the end of the Wall Street Journal, the point home. And the first sentence says, oh, well, maybe this isn't all bad news. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's... Why work? Yeah. Why work? Right. <laughs> well, only fools work. Yes, indeed. I agree. So anyway, that, that in some ways, and I'll go over this in more detail, but just to give you a sense of that the Wall Street Journal is structured first and foremost on very, very capsulized narratives about world events, you know, price of things, you know, the dominant economic news in the beginning, then a good part of it is due to the market data and then the interpretation of that market data. They'll have little articles about that, right? So if anyone's really, interested yeah, in yeah. interpretation of the markets, I mean, really pretty topical. Bloomberg does a good podcast called Odd Lots, I think, and uh, that's where I really got a good indoctrination in okay. the VIX <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the volatility market. Okay, um, and the VIX on yeah. the VIX. Yeah, yeah. It's, the VIX it's is really important. Good. Everybody's looking at that. I'm not so sure it really measures accurately, but everybody I just think looks it's at it. Yeah, it is. No, no, and I, it's I mean, a thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then you get off duty, meaning you're off work, you go to the wine no. part, you know, how to buy the right wine. So you have the lifestyle like, stuff. And then of course review. That's review. algorithmically review. deciding how good the wine is? I mean, <laughs> how are they deciding? <laughs> so I want to 95 to 100 equals retail magic. I but mean, what do these points really mean, Rachel? It doesn't mean anything. It depends on who's keeping the score, according Talk to the Wall Street Journal. lack of savoir vivre right Yes, there. indeed. <laughs> Yeah, Insane. yeah, and then you have eloquent rest, bed breakfast, you know, for, for the leisure class that can afford uh, to have that breakfast in bed, right? <laughs> anyway, I don't like you can start looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what about all the sections? Is there a weather section, I assume? Uh, you know, I don't think that they do have the weather. Yeah, they would I'm have sure to for commodities, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so review is books, yeah. culture, yeah. science, commerce, humor, politics. Language, technology, this art, is, and ideas. This is it emerging markets right here? Like psychedelics, mm. emerging markets? Well, the, the we're, psychedelics we're is emerging. probably <laughs> that some people on Wall Street are now looking at psychedelics. No, they are. <laughs> They're microdosing oh, yeah. psilocybin. Yeah. 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 yeah, I believe yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. get That's better ideas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I believe yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Indeed. So we'll go back over it. Either yeah, bring this do. one or next. I'll bring next week and we can. We can look yeah, at they it. Can modify I mean, it's good because look, yeah. if you read this on the weekend, I think you get an idea of what's going to be dominant in the Times for the week. What's you know, I mean, it's the way I read the New York Times, I read the business section, and then I interpret from the standpoint of that section towards the front page, etc. And I read it from that level. And the only thing that doesn't lie is the baseball scores and the NBA <laughs> scores. You know, you can't lie in sports, at least in the final. How's the political reporting in that? I'm How's the political reporting? Well, I mean, it's very right wing. I mean, you know, but it's not, it's not, it's not all right wing. It's, it's right wing what from the standpoint of maybe a William Buckley, Goldwater. You know, it, it still has that Russell Kirk Gold water, but it's it's modified for the current derivative, you know, markets. Yeah. So it turned in the lens through the lens of in, in understanding the markets, right? Yes, right. You're so always like, going to get the political. Right. So if something yeah, I mean, it's a justification of triumphalist capitalism. Right. You know, something is happening yeah. in always. Iraq may affect oil prices, uh, or yeah, you know, the like, analysis. The analysis right. in the Financial Times is a little bit better, I think. No, the Financial Times, if you want to do that next week, it's good too because it gives you a broader data. I mean, the data in the Financial Times isn't as technical as, as this and not as clear as this. And secondly, of all, it's much broader internationally. And the writing, the quality of writing is 10 times better. You have to know more. You have to have at least a little bit of a background in some of this stuff, you know, to really pick up on what's going on, especially when you're reading articles by Wolf and uh, others. Martin Wolf is a very, very good reporter, by the way. I mean, you know, he's yeah. not a leftist, but he's very, very solid in terms of his analysis. And Gillian Tesh, the, these two people are extremely good well, in terms of... Those days when they're yeah, yeah, when problems. they have their, their essays or just Google them, well, they're both they have their a financial Financial report. Times has a paywall. You, you can. Yeah. You, you got to buy it. 
Yeah, it's true. What do you mean? I mean, it's all you have to yeah, pay well. Yeah, you you can pay get, well. read those articles online. So it's smart people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. People yeah. Who you can get, it. I can get an academic discount. Maybe I'll just go ahead and do that. I get I can get the Financial Times for about 30 cents a, a day. Something like oh, that. if you're affiliated cents. with an academic institution, you can do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I will be soon. Yeah. So how often do you read this? How often do I read it? I read. I mean, I scan it online. I mean, you know, the market data. I, I, I personally, what I do. I mean, you know, and this is just very minimal these days because I don't, I don't really have the time. Um, but uh, I, I keep uh, about fifty to seventy-five stocks on a, on a list. You know, which I think is indicative of where things are. You know, I go through various industries and et cetera. And uh, you know, I, br I break it into categories. Etc. And then I read in the morning. I'll read the synopsis of Bloomberg. I'll read, you know, maybe online headlines. You know, then I'll follow company news. You know, and, and stuff like that. So I don't read this in its entirety. I mean, you know, if I, if Marx was alive, I can see him sitting at the New York Public oh, yeah. Library. If he was in the United States, okay. and he would have this: the Financial Times, Barron's, government statistics, BLS reports you know, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up, and he would be theorizing and extracting from this. You know, he understands this, and this, this to me is like reading footnotes. You know, you're reading footnotes to what we're doing on another level. This is really what it is, although the footnotes are very important. And if you read Capital through the footnotes, you begin to see not only the black humor of, 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 of you, know, <laughs> you begin to see, you know, very much the, you know, the, you begin to see, you know, Marx's genius at, at uh, you know, understanding, you know, this, you know, theoretically. Yeah, 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 yeah. You begin to see the work, and, uh, yeah. So in a way, yes, he would be reading this all the time, you know, uh, uh, et cetera, yeah. Yeah, and this would be part of his database. But it would also be government reports, the Federal Reserve reports, which are very important to Wall Street, the Federal Reserve minutes, because that's the cost they of money. Any, they, give, they give a synopsis of that, but reading the whole reports are usually interesting. What Yellen used to issue, and now this, uh, this Trump clown, you know, that's in, in there, right? In a way, and that makes me wary too of where we're going yeah, because yeah. you have to one, you know, you have to think that, you know, even though Bernanke and Yellen were, you know, players from the, you know, the dominant neoliberal thing, they were smart players. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas I'm not so sure how smart these people are. <coughs> you know, they're coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So guys. that that's a that could be a moment too to, to think about the federal, you know, what what is the role of the Federal Reserve. And the best book on that, what's his name? Oh, God, um, oh, um, I'm not blocking on his name. Very big tome by, uh, by a leftist. Um, uh, it'll come to me on the history. No, William uh, Grider. Yeah, Grider's oh, yeah. work. Secrets the of early, the Temple. Secrets of the Temple, yeah. yeah. I, I'm surprised that you respect something Grider wrote. Yeah, I told him, you know. He's kind of a liberal. He is a kind of a liberal. He's just yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, mean, you know, I thought it was a yeah. great book. Yeah, yeah. Read it years is. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, William Breyer, yeah, yeah, uh, the secrets oh, yeah. of the temple, yeah. yeah, and you know he, he writes some good stuff. Yeah. But what you said about the, as as any attempt at fiscal policy, you know, just falls away. It's Everything gone. becomes monetary policy. It's gone. It's gone. So the the Sad. Federal Reserve is more important than ever. It is the because temple. that's all. That gets done it in the, the economy anymore. That's what's happened. It is the temple, and why everybody, you know, speaks quote unquote in the language of money, or as when F. Scott Fitzgerald told Ernest Hemingway, "The rich are different from you and me." And Hemingway replied, "Yes, they have more money than we do." And then <laughs> Michael Cordelione, when approached with the question, "Is money uh, everything?" He says, "Only the people that don't have anything say that <laughs> money isn't everything." <laughs> <laughs> right. So in some ways, yeah, yeah, you get this kind of dominant, uh, you know, thinking. But yeah, I mean, this is part of the problem. The economic warfare has been almost completed, right? I mean, there is no fiscal policy. There's yeah. nothing to do. I mean, nobody's building programs in Bed Stuy. Look at housing York. policy it's all in New York housing City. Housing policy. That's one great example. With right our here. liberal Democrat mayor. Educational policy. Mayor, a tale yeah. of two cities, yeah. De Blasio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Educational. It's, it's all policy. tax it's all, incentives. Yeah, it's all, That's it. It's all right. propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the worst, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, for such a program, you know, in the beginning, 
you know, he's, he's turned out to be even worse, right? But Cynthia will fix it all. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> did she say that? Did she say that? Uh, did you see her on, um, what's the guy named? The I couldn't bear it, no. No, because he asked her questions. I don't watch TV. No, I just <laughs> happened to see this little snippet. It's the guy who used to be on the Colbert Report. No, no, Stephen Colbert, that's oh, right. okay. He had her on. Really? And it was funny because everybody was like, oh my gosh, she was so wonderful. I was looking at him like, you should be afraid of Stephen Colbert. He asked you questions that you showed yeah. you that you couldn't answer and you had no right? business. Yeah. Running for office, but she does. She has her. money. She has enough money. Yeah, so straight up. I mean, that's the only office? qualification, I think. Why are you running for office? You have money. Why are you qualified? I have money. Yeah. And she She's hesitated for. That's what she responded. He hesitated. She hesitated for a little bit, and then came up with wow. some yeah. random. Yeah. No, he threw her for a spin. Huh. Good. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It was great. Well, that's how I read it. Everybody else read it.